think we're close enough. Call the meeting to order. Welcome everybody here. Uh, pretty important meeting. We're running up against the wall now for uh, adoption of our budget. But I want this. I, this is a little bit different, so I want it to be efficient. Let's just, when I recognize somebody, let's hear them out, and uh, then we'll go to open discussion. Um, but I do want to answer everybody's questions and come away from here, I hope, tonight with, uh, with the budget we can, can live with. Um, so having said that, I'll get right to it. Um, need approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Motion carries. Okay. So, administration budget. Do you have something you want to say there before I got into the crowd here? Sure, just a little bit of a preamble. Thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Commissioners. I just want to acknowledge the hard work that the uh, governing board has done to overcome an incredibly exceptional onboarding period um, with the large number of new elected officials that have come on board. Um, you didn't necessarily have the luxury of leaning on someone who has been in office a long time. The experience level dropped from 25 years on average to 10 years on average. Uh, two thirds of you were learning each other new for the first time. You attended an essentials of local government class that was highly abridged from what previous commissioners had attended. And so I'll give you a plug. Even if you went to the former essentials class, the School of Government has a much more robust class, so please sign up. And I think that um, you know, you're signed up for that, so I applaud you for that. That's going to be a, a much more um, uh, encompassing class than the one that I think that you had experienced. And you did all that in a global pandemic. So you were restricted on when you could meet. When you did meet, you were restricted on how you could meet. So I applaud you for overcoming a lot <coughs> of um, onboarding obstacles that were truly exceptional. I think as part of that process, it may have become confusing or misunderstood on what the roles of staff were. So I just wanted to reemphasize that staff is here to assist you. We are here to help you and put you in a position where you can make the most informed decision on the topics that are placed before you. So as an example, the one-on-one -on -one monthly meetings where uh, I share with you uh, the, the draft budget or even the work sessions that we go through, all those are intended to get as much information and get you in a place that's uh, comfortable. So again, tonight, we are here to help you and get uh, any answers that are necessary to put you in a position to make a decision. And also know that when we bring you forth a recommendation, whether it's a topic or whether it's the budget, it's based upon a fiscal analysis, a policy analysis, um, and, and operational details that we have that you might not have access to. But understand they're just a recommendation. It's not a us versus you. It's just a way to get through an analysis and give you something to comment upon. And whether you move on it or not, that's OK. It's just an option to start a discussion. And then lastly, I'll, I'll mention what the mayor said. We were getting very close on time to adopt. We have one week left in uh, the statutory time frame. We still have yet to load the budget into the software. And until we do that, we can't execute the POs to start the government functioning uh, come July 1st. So I just wanted to share that as a preamble, and then I'll turn it back over to you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. OK, I'm going to try to work our way through this. Shannon, you sent a very good list that uh, you and Larry, I think, had worked on. And did, there, did it go to everybody? I didn't. It did. OK. Well, I think this is a good starting point, uh, work down this list. Uh, do you want to run with it? You want Larry to run with it? You want me to run with it? <laughs> Why don't you go ahead? That's, that's okay. fine there. OK. There's a uh, number of questions. Uh, you wanted clarification on cell phone usage for employees. And does everyone employed by the town get a cell phone stipend? If so, why? Why not? How is the determination to provide a stipend made? And what reevaluations are made? And how often? And what is the townwide IT and phone policy? Joe? 
Okay. And just as an overview, Mayor, I'm going to try to tackle most of these, but there are some of uh, the questions that are related to police, fire, and parks and rec, I think, are pretty nuanced, and so I'm okay. going to call up the director to answer that. In regard to the first question, there is a cell, uh, cell phone is, you, is allowed for use by employees. For those employees that are at the supervisory level, the stipend is $50. So, so I, when I say um, supervisory level, I'm talking to department uh, directors. Those below that uh, are 35. The, the $50 ones is because someone on salary could get called at any moment. The one for the 35, either they are using that phone um, while they're on duty or they are literally on call or they're getting called into work. So it's not every employee, but for those that do get the stipend, it's a $50 stipend or a $35 stipend. Um, to that last part of the question, what is the townwide IT and phone policy? We have an appropriate use policy for technology that all of our employees have to sign off on. Question? I just needed to know the breakdown because the recommended budget for the cell phone usage for the town is $45,473. And that seemed excessive. I mean, when you break it down to everyone getting, let's just say $50 a month, I think it wound up being 75 employees. So I just wanted to know if <laughs> all employees were getting this stipend and how it was evaluated. Larry, did you have any other questions Where, about where that? did you pull that number from, Shannon? I added up all of the different cell phone. You added them up as yep. you went through? Okay. Because I was looking under admin or governing body and it's 600. Well, governing body is 600, finances 600. And I would expect, you know, the police and the fire to be much higher because... No, I get it. I just wondered where you pulled that number from. Yep. No, I added all of the different ones up. up. Okay. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes. Any other comments on that? Uh, do you want to talk about it? or? I, I just needed to have an understanding of where that large amount of money was going and how it was being distributed because, you know, it, it seems like, especially in the public works arena, I don't know. I mean, Larry and I talked about, you know, we didn't know if there were radios that could have been used instead. Um, since, for the most part, I don't believe any of those employees should be out of town limits, correct? Okay. Does yeah. anyone else have any concerns, Larry? Yeah, are there any other means of communication? I know the fire and police uh, have radios, but do we have any backup communications beyond the cell phones? So at one point in time, I think there were radios. Um, one thing I just wanted to add to the cell phone piece of it is one of the things you see in the line items, in addition to the allowances that Joe talked about, is if a fireman, if a public works firm, use those examples, have an iPad, they have cellular service. Also, you'll see uh, occasionally you have a few hotspots or cellular connection for internet. So those items are also added into your cell phone budgets because they are paid through Verizon. In regards to the radios, yes, we have a, a public works has an emergency radio system, um, and it's and I say public works. It's actually been distributed through all the other departments. Each of them have handhelds, or they have a truck mounted radio unit. And recently, and uh, we put a what I call a magic box in. It allows during emergency situations for us to communicate with the police and fire on the 800 megahertz system. So there is a secondary system as well. And I think one of your one of you guys' questions was uh, about the radio line item that was zero. That's just coming from the old chart of accounts where we had originally made some investments about battery replacements or we've done some upgrades to that what i call magic box that's at the fire station that allows us to communicate together but uh, that's it but yes we we do have a backup system that we use in emergency situations and we use it for a lot of times for public works for traffic control situations and stuff like that because it's instant and immediate feedback uh, 
Other comments or questions on that? Everybody okay? Okay, clarification about funds spent on appointed boards for appreciation and recognition. Okay, this is something new we've rolled out this year. Um, how it gets used is really gonna be dependent upon the governing board. This is just an attempt to recognize your volunteer boards whether they be your planning board, your board of adjustment, or your parks and rec advisory board. But the parks and rec advisory board also has two, I believe it's $2,000 set aside for them. Is, is that in addition to, or is that something different, Sheila? Or Joe, if Joe has the answer. I'll turn it to Sheila. So the, the $2,000 that's in our budget for the Parks and Rec Advisory Board wasn't necessarily for appreciation of that board. Um, it is for training and to provide um, like engagement efforts of that advisory board with the community uh, as well as to help them each year. We do a retreat um, to develop, to review what the Parks and Rec Department is doing and how we're working with the advisory board and how the advisory board would like to work with the department and the community for that year. So. That $2,000 uh, was something that we initiated last year, but with COVID, we've not really been able to do a whole lot with, uh, to just help give them a resource to help connect with the community. So um, for example, this year, their retreat, they identified a, a list of things that they wanted to do, but two of the themes coming out of that were community engagement and community awareness. So they wanted to be able to engage with our community to make sure that you know they had a face and that people knew of the parks and rec department and knew of um of what the parks and rec advisory board does and how that people can get involved so both of the community awareness and community engagement go hand in hand and how they can do that so okay that's what that two thousand okay means. all right so it's separate from that yes. okay thank you other questions on that Governing body salaries. I think I can answer that a little bit. Um, back some years ago, and I mean some years ago, <laughs> we struggled every year like what to do for the town board uh, and decided that whatever the, the base was at that time, that it would just simply be whatever the cost of living index is year after year after year. And we would not revisit it to take you know, trying to get the politics out of it so people couldn't say, oh, you're giving yourself a big fat raise or whatever. So that's what it is now. It's up to this board if you want to keep it that way. But that was our attempt to stabilize it every year so that, again, we didn't have that conundrum, if you will, of well, what are we gonna do with our own salaries? So we don't need, we have since that time, it's just cost of living. If it's zero, then it's zero. Uh, and that's the way it's been for, for years. You may not want to keep it that way, but that's how it got to what it is today. So any questions on that? Is that written in a policy what, that we could read? I don't know, I don't remember it was done. I'm not kidding you, it was done quite some time back. Uh, I don't. I don't even know if Lisa was. <coughs> did you hear me? And could you answer his question? So just we just said that's the way it was, and that's the way. It was. Okay. We probably should draft a policy or something we can all reference. And that's fine. You know, we were a little. Uh, Less strict back then. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, does that answer your question for both of you? Mm -hmm. Does it answer it for everybody else? Okay, we'll put it on the list to make it a policy then. Uh, to, okay. Uh, well, I'm, I'm doing it, I'm looking by department and I'm looking at governing body, which sort of fits in here. Um, I, several of you had asked me about. Uh, um, setting aside 300000 for attorney's fees. Did, did, uh, did y'all want to talk about that? Uh, if that's the time to talk about it, yeah, I'd like to talk about that. Now's a good time. I'm trying to follow mine through the book while I'm following yours down the page. 
So whoever wants to speak, go. Well, I guess my first question is looking at 2019 actual of 261,000 and then projected for next year all the way to 300,000. Is that an hourly rate increase or why the $40,000 increase? Okay, that does not affect, that does not include all of Wyrick Robbins. Other items in there include retreat, as an example. Um, I'm going through my book, but that's not all. Um, so this includes the internal or the um, internal audit we have the on our books. The audit is listed separately. Yeah. Yes. But it is listed here at thirty thousand. Right. Yeah. And then the retreat, I assume, was a facilitator or the expense of the retreat. Both of those, yes. Um, I think that putting all of Wyrick Robbins charges on the governing board uh, does not appropriately reflect the usage by town staff of Wyrick Robbins in their uh, staff meetings. And so I think that that needs to be changed or maybe we just adjust the amount that is um, going to be reflected on the governing board, that number. The, the distinction would be about 15,000. Um, the, the, the services that Wyrick Robbins come in that are attached exclusively to staff are attendance at those management team meetings. Everything else is business of the town, whether it's um, due diligence on the GSK property as an example or attending meetings like this. So we can appropriate it um, anywhere. The, the bottom line is the budget amount will stay the same. Yeah, and, and I personally like to see a focus so you don't have to go through like you did on sale and add stuff up if you can. I mean, if it's significant, which I don't think that amount is significant. Well, it is it is also of interest to know, and this is arbitrary, folks, um, that say the planning board or the plan department used, you know, Wyrick Robbins for... $12,000 of the $15,000, you know, there would naturally be a question as to why. Well, it can actually, um, in my mind, be done as a subnote, just like these are done as subnotes. But you, which, which I think is valuable in order for us to understand the, the accounting. You don't have to go through, <clears throat> you know, that's what I was trying to avoid. Yeah. But. Is everybody okay with this? I mean, I know I had several of you ask me questions, so I wanted to be sure it got out on the floor. I noticed Eric I'm not saying anything. No, sorry, being silly. Is everybody okay? Good answer. Ready to go. Okay. All right. Uh, A quick question on group health. How many people does that cover? I know we have some retired state employees on the board, one still working with the state. We waive the health insurance, so that 37,800 is for how many people? We have about 70, a little less than that, full-time employees. We also, depending upon when they retired from the town, uh, we covered their supplemental insurance. So this is the governing the body budget. That. I'm just curious how many people are in that 37,800. Uh, let's see. Okay, that 37, eight, that's, you'll find that uh, department by department. Um, that's, that's the health insurance for that particular department. So you'll see, you'll see, so as an example, the 37, eight is, the health insurance for you all. When you go to budget and finance, there'll be another number for health insurance. That's for that department. Was that your question, Larry? Yeah, well, my question was, in the governing um, body budget, which is a standalone budget for the board, how many people does that 37,800 cover? Okay. Let me get Bobby to answer that. 
That's for all six of you. Um, when you opt out and get the cafe paid, that comes out of that same line item. Um, and when you opt out, what ends up happening, just some cleanup during the year later, it, it, your FICA will be additional, it'll be more than what it says here, the 3,100, um, because of the way when you opt out, I think four of you opt out, I believe. So, but anyway, the opt out pay that you get comes out of there. But that 37A is for six, all six of you. If we opt out, it just seems like that number would be taken out of this health line budget because it's not an expense. Well, when you, when you get the cafe paid, when you opt out, it comes out of there. The, the group insurance line. Right. If you opt out, you still get paid, but it doesn't seem like these number, these, in other words, I'm trying to drill down to these numbers and I can't figure out where they come from. Yeah, it's basically about, I think, 5,800 5, or, or 6,000, 6,100 or 6,200 per person, what we allocate townwide for everybody. So that's what it is, 61 or 6,200 times six. So this is showing six people, but yet we're not all taking the insurance, right. is what I'm, what I'm trying to say. Right. So but we when do you opt get out, a, a stipend out of it. Yeah, but then you should budget that in a different category. That Otherwise, was, this budget really right. makes no sense. Either way, yeah. you know, I, I'm just trying to classify no, the expenses. It, it's like saying for me, it doesn't make that much difference, but it does to you, that's fine. I'm not, yeah, I'm not arguing with you. Yeah. No problem. Bobby, may, may, I, may I skip since he's up yes. here? If, if you're, if, if Larry, if you're sir, done, you Larry. Through Larry. Well, I'll drill down later. It just doesn't seem like you should take, if there's six people and insurance is 6000 per person, for example, that is $36,000. But if several of the people waive that expense, I don't see why the expense is being reported when it is not an expense. Well, it still sort of is when you get, okay, so you're allocated, I think it's 500 and some a month, okay? When you opt out, you get about 70, 75%. So when you get that 75%, it's also charged to group insurance. So I get what you're saying, but it is still being charged to the group insurance line. Yeah, it just seems like it should be reported as a different expense than health insurance. We could call it something different. Um, the dollar figure in the end really won't be any different, though. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, we, we can talk about it later. If, if the total number is still 37.8, that's fine, but I think it needs to be in the budget as the appropriate expense. Okay. See, the way we put it in, we don't know who's going to opt out. Um, so we allocate the whole 6,200 per person. and. Then, like I said, as the year shakes out, for those that opt out, the FICA, we end up transferring some from the insurance to the FICA to cover the additional FICA. Um, because they're, when we get the CAFE pay, we're paying FICA on that also, which increases the, the FICA line more than what we budgeted for. So they sort of even out. Um, but I get what you're saying. John? Um, on B3, page B3, just in case you need to reference it, um, the property taxes for 2022 are projected to be less than what the estimated taxes are for 2021. Is that just because the sp spending is down and this is not the actual, no. like, rooftop taxes? Mm -hmm. On B3, the operating the 6.6 .6 million, that is the operating portion of the property tax revenue. If you go to B7, seven, that is the dedicated <coughs> property tax portion. You see the million 028. Where, where are you on B7? Uh, excuse me, B6, I'm sorry, B6 where it lists the ca other financing sources for capital, the first one. So if you add them, it's really 7,628 is gonna be the grand total. The grand total will be 7,628, 
Okay. Once again, I think maybe a little bit more clarification and help for us to in, in deciphering the budget would be useful. Um, any other questions about that, guys? It, and then I just have a question for on B4 about the investment earnings. Yeah, they're next to nothing. Right. Um, but they, they didn't used to be. Yeah, well, interest rates are at all time lows right now, so we're earning nothing. I okay. mean, we'll be lucky at $3,000 this year. Okay. Whereas two or three years ago, we were 215000 I think. R right, this is why I had that question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, sorry, Mayor. All right, thank you. Uh, I want to circle back to insurance. One thing that's kind of bothered me a little bit uh, is that this year we brought the consultants in and the consultants said, okay, we were able to negotiate the insurance rates the same as they were last year. But then, as I understand it, there was a consultant fee over and above that. No, for groups our size, there's a flat commission no matter what. So the, our previous broker was earning the same commission as this Guy, so I just are. that's what I want to be sure of is that the consultant's fee is coming out of the premium, not adding on top of the premium. Correct. And I had wondered that and I wanted to be sure that that's the way it was because if not, you're not putting apples to apples. Yeah, right. I think it's a flat 5%, I want to say. It, right. But that, that 5%, again, to be clear, I don't mean to run it in the dirt, comes out off of the premium, not add on for their services on top of the premium. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, like what we pay to the United Healthcare, they cut IBA a commission check. They pay out of that. I got it. That's all I wanted to be sure because it was not clear to me when they made that presentation and I tried to get clarification and it's just been something in the back of my head itching <laughs> to know the correct answer for it. So. I'll leave that alone. The, the last question that I personally have on this issue has to do with uh, 15000 for early elections. I know that because of those fees, uh, a lot of municipal governments are trying to decide whether to do early elections or not, since in our case, that is really high per vote. Uh, so I don't know if, if, I don't know about that number. I had thought that we had decided that we weren't going to do early elections. And so is that 15 grand for the early elections or is it, it that's just the cost of elections now? I believe that's just the cost of elections. <clears throat> Yeah, the note next to the 15,000 says it does not include early voting. The 15,000 is just your, the cost for your standard election. Okay, it says it does not include early elections. My oversight, sorry. So, okay. All right, I want to move on down uh, Shannon and Larry's list. Uh, budget and finance, what are the professional services and are these services ever reviewed and sent out for bid? I'm going to let Bobby answer that. Uh, basically, what this is made up of is the um, actuarial study that's done for the um, OPEB, other, other post-employment benefits, and the law enforcement officer's separation allowance. Uh, the League of Municipalities contracts with Kavanaugh and McDonald. Uh, that's who, who does the study. And it's about $5,000 a year. Uh, other things that are paid out of there are um, the CAFR application fee, uh, and then printing the CAFR, and then some drug testing, and then um, wire and bank fee, really. That's the only thing, the only other things that come out of this line. Okay. That answer everybody's question? Okay, explain the advertising line and budget and finance. Uh, that's just for... Uh, the public notice of uh, budget public hearing, really that's all that is, the $200. Okay. Everybody okay? All right, uh, admin, 
Who's the public information officer? That would be me. So we do public uh, public information while it is com while it is listed under the administration department. It's listed there uh, primarily for bookkeeping. So the day will come when we have a public information officer. We need it sooner than later. But how we operationalize that is it's decentralized to each department for them to push out information, for them to share each other's posts. Um, I'll put out information that um, I'm looking to push out, but also I'm getting information from them based upon their experiences. But specifically, the public information officer, typically for a town this size, is your manager. Other questions? What's the part-time salary and for who? Okay, that was zeroed out this year. Typically, we have a um, Master of Public Administration grad student who serves as an intern. Uh, we were not able to do that this year or last year because of COVID and also uh, because we had lingering effects of COVID, but also times were tight. We zeroed that out. <clears throat> Elaborate on contracted services. Okay, so this includes um, a lot of employee training. That can uh, be online training. That can be, um, it can also be uh, associated with our employee assistant program overseen by McLaughlin Young. Those are some examples of the contracted services. The employee assistance program is then different than the tuition assistance program? Yeah, tuition assistance is, is nothing more than if someone goes back uh, to pursue a degree, uh, we allot as much as $1,000 a year per employee, uh, but that's, that's separate than employee assistance. Employee uh, assistance is really um, uh, more psychological, social support related services. Yeah, that line item's more than doubled since 2020. What actually drove that increase? For example, we were at fifteen thousand eight hundred and forty nine dollars actual in twenty twenty. And we're recommending forty one thousand for the next budget cycle. Yeah, I mean, I'd have to go back and look and see what we budgeted in years past, but we're, 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 we are considerably beefing up our training now. So as an example, uh, and you've, you've, seen this mentioned in the, you've seen this mentioned in the weekly updates, things like our diversity and inclusivity training, so that the amount of training we're pushing out has, has bumped up. Does that represent the change that you're talking about? I don't know, I'd have to go back and look at that previous years, but we are pumping up the amount of training. And most of that's going to be conducted by outside trainers? Um, it, it can be. It uh, can be online. Um, we can also do some of that internally. Uh, we're even doing some of it by uh, partnering with some of our um, um, adjacent local governments. So there's a myriad of ways for us to push that out. Everybody okay? Mm -hmm. Website. Are we doing updates and who's doing them? Um, we have the capability to make minor updates. Uh, the major updates, which I think is what the question was related to, would uh, we've got a contract to upkeep and um, administer the website through a company called VC3. Um, we could pull the trigger sooner and have them upgrade the site, but right now our contract runs through uh, next year. And so we've got internal folks that are updating the website, and is that done? I, I'm assuming, I, I think that Lisa was doing it for quite some time, correct? It, is, 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 are we still having one person do it? No, oh. no. It, it's very much like the public information. We, we have to decentralize it for an organization our size, so it's really up to each department to update their own pages. Okay. And the $9,400, even though it, the, it requested was 13349 so you were able to negotiate the contract with VC3? 
down to 9,400? No, there's, um, there were some thing, it, it wasn't a negotiation, it was the fact that some things got pulled out. We're also um, looking to, so we've got some networking services that we're contracting that we're looking to do differently. And so the scope of that service is going to change. And so that's really the driver of that, the change that you're referring to. Does the contract include uh, cybersecurity? That is covered actually in um, our insurance. And so our insurance rates for property insurance went up significantly and it went up significantly uh, for our cyber protection. But that's not related to the contract that I was just referring to. That's just an insurance through the league. Any other questions on that? Okay, um, explain the reduction in the wellness program. Yeah, so we've had a very robust um, and effective wellness program. One of the things, because we are such a small staff, we want to keep our staff uh, healthy so we're, we're not having as many people out of work, uh, but also we're trying to keep our health insurance premiums in line. So we were doing some very aggressive things in the previous years, uh, things like nutrition classes, um, and we've just cut back on that because the finances are tight, but also the COVID restrictions really limited our ability to come together for events like that. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, is tuition 5000 per class, per person, per degree? It's 1000 per person per year. Per year. Right. 5000 is just the total. I they asked the question. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you, and you had already answered it, but thank you. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? How much of that's being used? I'm the only one using it right now, I believe. We had, uh, we had a promising opportunity with one of uh, Michael's employees, but she decided to go to school full time. So, but we keep pushing out there. We would love for our employees to pursue and take advantage of this program. And that's on a first come first serve basis. I that's assume. correct. Okay. Who is in charge of East Wake TV? Yeah, I, I guess that would be me. <laughs> it's um, as far as representing the town of Zebulon. It's, it's a consortium of seven different municipalities, that, so they all have a, a seventh of a piece of the pie, so to speak. So we're one-seventh, uh, I as your manager and the representative for the town, but there's seven voices at the table. Is, is that fee the same across all of the, the municipalities, or is it um, larger for the larger towns? No, the way... The way uh, the public education and government funds work is they have a pot of uh, money at the state. I want to say it's $4 million. They distribute it by the number of stations. Each town within East Wake TV has two stations, and so the equivalent is about 56000 So each town gets 56000 that rolls through them and then just gets funneled directly through to East Wake TV, actually PEG Media is the name of the company. Okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. And again, for clarification, that is run by a board of directors of which you represent us. Correct. On that board. Okay, other questions on East Wake TV? All right. Planning, what, uh, explain minimum housing. Yeah, I'm going to let Michael explain some of the details about uh, what we encounter and what we have to work through when we come across a minimum housing case. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the board. Uh, minimum housing is actually the most complex of our code enforcement process, unlike typical code enforcement processes where like, tall grass and weeds or junk and debris, which allows our staff to go and just do a review from the exterior. Minimum housing cases um, actually require legal review to make sure that we're contacting the proper, proper property owner. Additionally, it requires us to contract services to other organizations and um, individuals. Specifically, a typical co-enforcement case would include um, legal review to make sure we have the correct property owner. 
hiring um, uh, a contractor to go in um, with our building inspector, um, as well as our staff to determine the value of improvements necessary to be made, because that's where the threshold on whether or not it moves forward with full uh, minimum housing case or not um, would take in consideration. Additionally, a lot of these structures also have uh, some sort of infestation problem. Um, so part of that is also contacting an exterminator. One, to make sure our staff is safe, um, and two, to make sure that that problem doesn't spread to the neighboring properties. The amount that's budgeted is uh, an average ballpark to allow for us to address three minimum housing cases per year. Um, each of those does have a different value based on the intensity. Um, as an example, there was one on East Lee Street a couple of years ago um, that exceeded $4,000 per year for multiple years. So that, that is uh, an estimate um, based on several years of data. And the Housing Authority doesn't take up any of those expenses, say like when there's an infestation? No. No, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Other questions on uh, planning? All right, police. What does materials and supplies include? I'm going to recognize the police chief to run through this category. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Hope y'all are doing well. Uh, materials and supplies is kind of the miscellaneous catch-all. Um, it includes office supplies, um, battery replacement plaques, business cards, chairs for the office defibrillators. It's just sort of a miscellaneous type file or line. Questions? All right, community policing. Oh, leasing. I'll get it out. Um, the community policing line helps us support different community engagement programs, so National Night Out, um, when we go into the elementary schools and hand out rulers, markers, pens, um, the wristbands that we have for kids. Um, it would include any kind of like popsicle event or pop-up kind of party that we do in a community. Um, in the coming year, we'll be implementing our first um, community academy and it will supply funding for that as well. Wasn't there a separate line item for Citizens Academy that I saw somewhere? Maybe not, or maybe it was zeroed out. I don't recall that. There is a separate line for Shop with a Cop, maybe right. you're thinking about that, and that's donated money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Explain the Mudcat special pricing for off-duty police services. Um, so there was a contract negotiated with Mudcats a couple of years ago that offered them a rate of $25 an hour. Um, they also supply a meal for the officers who are working. Um, this is something that will be ne renegotiated in the coming year, but th the way that the baseball season went this year and how it kind of we didn't know when it was gonna happen. We did not go through a negotiation process, but um, the general manager knows that it'll be something we'll talk about in the coming year. I believe that from what I've been told is that part of that contract negotiation included tickets for the police department, and I'm not sure, well, <coughs> perhaps before you're, you were here, and I, I really think it's important for us to get that contract renegotiated so that the officers are being paid an appropriate amount and that there is nothing else that is exchanging hands that is perhaps not above board. Well, we have a certain number of tickets for every game anyway. Correct. So, but I just want to be sure everybody knew that. So if anybody wants to go to the game, they can come down here and get a ticket and go to the game. So. Yeah, the other hourly rate for off-duty officers, do we know if that's been revised to include the price of the vehicle, fuel, wear and tear? It has not been. Um, there are, 
there are um, other fees that are associated with it other than the base salary, so the insurance. Um, what other items fall into the general? FICA. FICA and retirement. Uh, but no, that's something for us to reevaluate in addition to the base salary because we're not competitive. Okay, it's on the to-do list. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Well, and one thing to remember is that that is in town. So there's a certain level of service that we're obligated to provide, not necessarily in the stadium, uh, but it is within our corporate limits. What, the stadium? Mm -hmm. Stadium. Oh, well, yes, of course, but they do hire. I just want to sure you all were aware that there are certain obligations that we have out there, not necessarily in the stadium, I'm not saying that, but maybe traffic control or something of that nature that as we would for like we did the parade the other day. There's yeah. certainly a benefit to having designated personnel and, and yeah. alleviate that responsibility from the patrol teams. So I do understand what you're saying there. Okay, I just wanted to make sure it was on the floor. Everybody understood it. Okay, uh, ammunition prices. Um, so the m most significant thing that impacted this line was that at the end of this fiscal year, we saw a variety of savings in different accounts. COVID impacted operations. We were able to um, save money in a couple of different lines, and we were able to implement a um, firearm transition program this year that we had intended to do next and that was originally planned for the capital um, improvement plan for next year. So we bought some ammo ahead of time and it reduced the line this year. Okay, great. Do we ever have uh, ammo that's um, outdated? S n not that I'm aware of. So we typically have um, a two-year stockpile of ammo, so we're, we're using it. Um, it doesn't sit around and collect dust at all. Okay, uh, explain the weapons line. Uh, same as I just described, having purchased the, oh, okay. So we were able to do the um, firearms project a little bit earlier and it, it then reduces the potential for having to replace firearms that are older or repair firearms that are older. Um, and the amount of money that's left in there right now is um, if, if when we get a new officer to come on, uh, purchasing that firearm and any kind of basic repairs until we get switched over to the nine millimeters, which will be in September. So this is just the, the cut from 13.5 to 2,000 is because you had some savings that you had realized and that's why that cut was able to be made. And we implemented that transition program in 2021 instead of 2022. Okay. But it happened just in the last six weeks or so. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, you're going from 45 to 9 millimeter. Do you have two years worth of 45 caliber ammunition to dispose of or sell or? We do, and um, part of the 13.5 that was originally budgeted for this program included a, a sell back and a trade in on both the firearms that we have in our inventory and the ammunition that we have in our inventory. So the project, I don't know, maybe 20, 21,000, but we were getting um, reimbursement on selling back the old guns and ammo. Okay. Uniforms. Uniforms. Does explain uniforms. <laughs> um, all right. So I'll, I'll start with a, a brand new officer. To completely outfit a brand new officer, it's about $11,500 for the uniforms and equipment that are, is on his belt. If we hire a replacement officer, um, new uniforms for that person is about $2,600. Um, the, the outfit that they're wearing needs to be replaced every year to two. I mean, they get three outfits that they wear 182 days a year, and, and it's out in the element. 
Um, so we replace their three different uniforms. We replace their boots annually. The boots are $125 a piece. The three sets of uniforms are about $600 a piece. Um, so replacement uniforms for staff comes out to be about fifteen or sixteen thousand um, dollars ballistic vests are seven hundred and seventy dollars a piece and we purchase between like five and seven a year so there's thirty five hundred four thousand dollars a year towards ballistic vests um, the new hires so thirty eight I think it's thirty eight thousand dollars comes quick thirty five thousand dollars Okay, explain contracted services. I'm assuming this is other, not yeah, the, the other. What's, yeah. what's the other? So this involves um, access to various criminal justice information systems. It involves our like LexisNexis or Westlaw, um, TLO, LexisNexis, um, DCI through okay. the state. Okay. Um, it's our records management system. It's access to the CAD. It's the um, the firm that does our pre-hire medicals and screenings, it's our body cameras and in-car cameras, um, 800 megahertz radio system, the random drug testing we do for our officers. Okay, great, thank you. Does that still include the, there was a legal service for the police department? That's separate. So Smith Rogers, Aldridge, um, we pay $5,700 a year to them, they are, um, they specialize in law enforcement services and they provide 24-7, 365 access. Um, we employ them 25 times a year, so do we call in and our, our sergeants can call them at any time after hours and they are exceptionally responsive. Um, they just have a skill set uh, that is very specific to law enforcement services. Okay. Well, you had it down next, Smith Rogers. Uh, why the cut in SERT, sir? Yeah, so the SERT team, um, a lot of the items that they use will come through other operational lines, like their uniforms. Um, on occasion, they will need specialized equipment of some sort. And this year, the specialized equipment that we're asking for for their unit is in the capital line. So there's $5,000 included in the capital budget for um, some surveillance type equipment that you will see. Anything else? No, thank you so much. Okay, fire. I recognize the fire chief to respond to these questions. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> volunteer pay. Explain volunteers getting paid. Uh, it may be as easy to tell you what it doesn't include as it, what it does include. So if you'll allow me to explain how that kind of works. So, so our volunteer members, um, we require an enormous amount of training, um, call participation, duty crew time. But unfortunately, due to the Fair Labor Standards Act, we're not allowed to pay them any amount, dollar amount, at like an hourly rate or what have you. Um, so there's, there's no compensation at an hourly rate that we can provide. If we did, they would be employees and not volunteers, if that, if that makes sense. So many years ago, the, the board decided to compensate volunteers a pay-per-call system, a turnout compensation program, and it's aimed at reimbur reimbursing the volunteer for fuel, um, clothing that may get, be damaged in order just to offer some compensation to offset expenses. Um, so the, what you see reflected in the budget uh, is the amount of money is based on the 20 volunteers that we try to maintain and the, that paper call compensation that they receive. So what do they get? Oh, go ahead, though. Yeah, what do they get paid per call? Nine dollars. Nine dollars. Mm -hmm. Hasn't went up, hasn't went up much from the 70s. It used to be five dollars. Yeah, it has yeah. not. Unfortunately, it has not gone. And the last increase um, that we provided to the firefighters. 
Um, we learned that we, that was taxable income, even though it, the way it was done. So we gave them an increase. Uh, we were we were trying to pay them eight dollars per call, and when we took the taxes out, they were actually making even less. So we increased it a dollar, so we could offset the the taxes. So they've been making the same thing for a long, long time. And then again, just to be clear about the budget, the fringe benefits is so that the volunteers get the the t-shirts and the outfits that they need. That's just right, to it, exactly. It's t-shirts, it's those kind of things, but it's also um, membership in like, for example, the uh, State Firemen's Association, um, those type things are also included, which provides them some um, accidental death and dismemberment insurance and those type things and opportunity to be um, for uh, scholarships and that type of thing through the association, but that's the kind of thing, as well as a monthly meal um, we provide. Now, I have a question that um, maybe Chief Boykin might, you know, both of you might have an answer for, maybe just Joe. Um, the, does the enterprise contract lower the vehicle maintenance lines any for us? Have, are, are we going to see that? Is that anticipated? Um, that's the idea. The, um, I think the reality is, though, the number of vehicles that we can use that Enterprise provides is relatively small. So we're looking at five vehicles for this coming year in the Enterprise, and that's probably the max for the type of vehicle that we can use. Enterprise provides typically a, a, a consumer type of vehicle, so we're not going to be able to use um, enterprise for police cruisers we're not going to be able to use them for uh, public works equipment or uh, even for, the crew cab there, there are some exceptions okay. that we can use but okay. uh, again that they are so small that while in theory they will lower the maintenance costs you, you won't see it as a budget because it's such a small drop in the, okay. in the okay. pond so to speak thank you ems water <clears throat> sewer now the dms east wake ems is gone Sure. So with the um, preparation of the budget, the status of the Eastern Wake EMS facility had not been completely decided as of we're still working through that now, as everybody knows. The amount you see in the budget is a minimal amount just to maintain uh, power, water, that type thing on the building um, until that final use is determined. So we, we put some money in there to cover those, those basic utilities. With the building not being occupied, we're not expecting it to be a whole lot of cost. Okay. Materials and supplies. So our materials and supplies are very similar to what Chief Boykin described. It's, it's a um, somewhat of a catch-all for us. It's janitorial supplies. Um, we do our own janitorial work in our station. It's um, expendable materials such as firefighting foam, the absorbents we use on motor vehicle accidents, fire prevention supplies, plastic hats, coloring books, um, that type thing. Um, other equipment, you know, batteries and medical oxygen, all of that falls into our supplies category. The only other thing that I'll mention that comes out of that as well is what um, we have referred to in the past and the county likes to refer to as small capital, which is stuff like replacement chainsaws or replacement fan, items that they're, quite honestly, they're expensive, but they're not typically categorized as capital items because they're, they're small in nature. Um, so those are the kind of things that get kind of rolled into the materials and supplies. The uh, question I had is where does most of our overtime come from? So the um, great question. So for our employees to work their scheduled number of hours, um, there's overtime built into that. There, unfortunately, there's more hours in the day than the Fair Labor Standards Act will let us pay for without paying overtime. So there's a built-in amount of overtime um, just for the employees to work the number of hours they need to work. And then this year includes uh, coverage of all of those hours, which includes that 10th day, which was listed as an expansion to this year's budget. And it's again, it's just covering the number of hours in the day for our employees. Um, very little of that would be callback training and that kind of thing, because we typically try to minimize how much our employees have to come back when they're off duty. We try to give them as much in training while they're working as we can. So just to help me understand that, uh, an employee shift is how many hours? 24 hours. So they run a 24-hour shift, and they run it, then they're off 
They work 24 hours and they're off 24, work 24, off 24, and then work 24, and then they're off four days. Okay. They work in, it may How help. much of that actually, what I'm trying to get at is how much of that actually pushes into overtime? So the employee who works the bare minimum number of hours um, is going to work at least four hours. Um, one, two of the shifts are going to work at least four hours of overtime per employee. Um, one shift well, under the new program will work about 28 hours of overtime per, per work cycle. Um, so that's where there. And that also involves, just for your information, that's based on a 56-hour work week where all of our, myself included, work a 40-hour work week. All of our shift employees, we're allowed to work them 56 hours before they're eligible for overtime. Okay. And, and well, the motivation for my questioning was there was some questions about Wake County EMS and their overtime, and I don't know if you're familiar with That's, any of that or not. That's not for this. Uh, and, and it all deals with calculation of those hours over. Well, what makes um, emergency service um, payroll complicated is employees start work on one day and they end work on the next day. Right. And that's, that's where, the, that's where the, come, the, the hard part comes is how many hours in an actual day and especially when you have holidays and such as that. You know, you, the employees actually work in two hours, two days at the same time. Well, that's their problem, not ours. That's right. I yes, sir. I agree, sir. To, uh, yeah, how does the Fair Labor's Overtime Act apply for EMS or fire? Typically, it's a 40-hour work week within a seven-day time frame, but how does it work with a fireman? So it's two, if you look at it from a weekly perspective, it's 56 hours instead of 40, and that's because they're allowed to sleep part of their shift. Um, the, the Fair Labor Standards Act goes in there, and, and it specifically defines the job responsibilities, and it's basically if, if you meet those responsibilities and meet those, uh, that criteria, for example, that, that the sleeping, for example, um, then you're, you're, you can work, be required to work more hours before the time and a half overtime kicks in. And that's, that's exactly what we're using. If you take some organizations who do not, um, that use different ways than their, for example, EMS, they may, they may apply it in different ways, but for fire, it's, it's a 56 hour work week, it's a standard week. Now, one further question then, if they're on a fire call and their shift runs out, so they stay on that fire call, do they get overtime? For That's that? a, either overtime or, compensa or comp time. Okay. One, we'll we'll or. issue them one or the other at time and a half when it's over. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Other questions on fire? Thank you, Chief. All right, Parks and Rec. I recognize the Parks and Rec director. Okay, they want to know about your overtime. Yes. So um, I'm the only employee in our department that is exempt. So busy times of the year for us are always spring, summer, and then the holidays. And like, well, I'm gonna use the example of the downtown tree lighting. Um, that's a week it takes a lot of staff hours to prepare for, to make sure that it runs smooth, and it's a long day, and it's an all hands on deck type of situation. Um, all of the employees that work in our department would be um, required that week to work over 40 hours. So we would have to compensate them either through comp time or overtime. Um, as standard rule in our department, um, I require staff to submit notification to me um, in advance if they expect to work over 40 hours and they're expected to first analyze whether or not their work week could be flexed um, or if there was another way to minimize the opportunity to exceed 40 hours. But because of the nature of our job, sometimes that's just not possible. Um, the, the challenge for us with deciding whether to do comp time or overtime, is, and I'm gonna stay with that example of the downtown tree lighting, but then my entire staff will accumulate um, comp time and then they're all going to want to have to, they, or they all have to take it off. And so then we're putting ex more um, challenges on the rest of our staff to continue to meet the needs of our citizens. And so we, we don't, I, I personally uh, don't like to see an amass of comp time throughout our department. 
um, because of the burden it does put on the other staff members um, with the limited staffing that we have and the amount of um, services that we provide. So, I mean, we have that option of comp time versus overtime. There are a lot of times we'll use that if it is effective. So if it's just something random happened and um, say there was a last minute call out, we had that situation last week. Um, where an employee at the community center had a medical emergency in their family. So one of the full-time staff members had to work um, over that 40 hours unexpectedly on the day of. Um, that's an example where we would we could use comp time because it might not impact significantly um, other employees. Do you have an expiration time on the comp time before it gets paid out? Yeah, so I believe what policy says is there's a certain amount of comp time that can be accrued. So like an employee could accrue, at least it's 80 hours. Yeah, they can accrue 80 hours before it rolls over. Um, and person, I, I, I can't afford for an employee to amass 80 hours of comp time. We'd be hurting. <laughs> but, you, but you would make them take it within a given time frame. Yeah, so it, ours, I, I don't believe our comp policy says they have to use that comp time within a certain amount of time or it expires. I mean, once they've earned it, they've earned it. it what will happen is when they hit over 80, like it can't exceed 80. So then I would be required to tell, like then they have to take time off if they continue to amass comp time. And so the decrease from even, you know, the 2021 amended budget and then the requested budget from 4,500 to a thousand is just you anticipating perhaps better employee budgeting uh, for the anticipated comp time? Um, that's coming from a couple of different areas. One of that is, you know, we're coming out of COVID and so there are some things where we're still navigating and not sure if we can do. Um, so that's where we were being extremely conservative there. Um, also, this is not something um, that um, our department, um, prior to me coming here, they weren't as um, strategic in that realm of planning for comp time and overtime. And I mean, we're just getting so busy. And as we come with this master plan, I, you know, I just have a high expectation for us to, to move forward and I just can't afford the comp time. So that I think that, over, that change in overtime is really just a, a COVID recognition, but I would anticipate that to grow moving forward. Anybody okay with that? Okay, the next two actually is part-time community center and then it says part-time parks maintenance versus subcontractors. Sure, I'll start with the community center. Um, so shared in the last year's budget process, uh, part of the master plan has included a staff and operational assessment. Um, some of you, I think I've even had one-on-one -on -one conversations about how the community center is operated. Um, the community center has relied heavily on your, pro your professional level staff, your program level staff to for the day-to-day -day operations for answering the phones, checking in participants, taking funds, registering participants, things like that. Um, those are all very important things to do, but all of the time that is dedicated to that and cleaning the facility is time where we're not planning and implementing programs and services to our community. Uh, so part of that assessment, ha you know, that stood out in the assessment and there were four things that um, the consultant came in and said that needed to to change if we were really going to grow our services. And one of those things was making sure that we are better utilizing part-time staff for frontline um, tasks, um, like we just described, and freeing up the professional level staff in order to push out more programs. And so, and to further that, um, as we uh, continue to navigate this master plan in our transition. We're expecting a retirement um, next year. So you saw in our budget memo that we're looking to restructure our staff. Um, there's gonna be a huge push from our department to expand programs outside of the community center. Um, so we're gonna be looking to expand beyond um, that campus to do more things out in the community um, and to engage our citizens more. And so with that, um, an extent, uh, an expansion of your part-time staff is going to be necessary. 
to cover just your operating hours. Go and then go ahead. the part-time maintenance yeah. versus, okay. Um, so there is a balance of working with subcontractors versus having to have somebody on hand. Um, there are things where working with a subcontractor is going to be great, and that's that you're going to come on Tuesday and you're going to cut the grass here on Tuesday. You're going to weed eat, do this, this, and this. But then our parks, to me, I view them as employees. They're the hardest working employee that this town has. Sorry, police, I fire. I think that'll be great too. But, but they don't ever get a break. Even when the park technically closes, there's still people out there using them, right? Um, and so when you have a contractor, they're not going to be on call. They're not going to be here and be responsive no matter what. I ran into a situation myself where, you know, I took my kids to a program. We were at the park. Someone had ripped a sign, a metal sign and stake, and it was a, a puncture issue. Like if a child fell on it, it would have been an issue. Um, there is no guarantee if you contracted out your park's maintenance um, from a full-time or part-time that when you make that phone call, anybody's going to respond to you because they have other contracts that they're working on. So we're always going to have some level of responsibility from part-time staff and full-time staff when it comes to park's maintenance. Um, but whenever there are opportunities, we are looking for them. So you see that in this budget. So we contracted out your basic landscaping for parks that we could. Um, we did not do that for like our joint use parks because there's a lot of technicalities and things we have to be careful of when we're working on school grounds. Um, and we also have proposed like contracted cleaning of our restroom facilities. That's a very deep clean on a regular basis. Uh, but that doesn't mean that when they're not there, we don't still have to go there multiple times a day to make sure there's toilet paper or that there's not a mess or anything like that that we need to clean up. Your litter sweep, I mean, we're still going to have to do that. You're getting, you know, your, your greenway um, is going to be that one and a half miles really equates just under four acres of parkland. But that's not parkland like Gill Street Park where I can go stand there and kind of get a good glimpse of what's going on. You actually have to walk or ride the entire length of it. Um, does that answer your question about the that balance? Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, since where is Arbor Day? I guess that's a special event. What was that question? I'm sorry. The question is where is Arbor Day? If we're a tree city, it needs to have a line on it. Okay. So Arbor Day, um, it well, the Tree City USA program um, is, is a collaboration between our tree board, the Public Works Department, and the Parks and Rec Department. And uh, it, those funds used to be in the Public Works Department. They were transferred over to Parks and Rec when we took over the tree board. And so um, there were, the Tree City USA um, budget was about fourteen dollars to $1,500 each year. And uh, that's those funds were used to um, purchase and plant the trees um, that were done. So that amount is incorporated into the park landscaping budget. Um, currently, it's not its own line item, but it is there. Uh, but our intent with um, not just Arbor Day, but just Tree City USA as part of it also, but um, Nature education and environmental education at large, um, we're going to have a stronger push for that. And so Arbor Day, um, we're going to be looking to do more than what's been done in the past. Um, so, and we want to incorporate it into some partnerships that we have um, potential for and larger, um, you know, own more ongoing um, educational program opportunities. And so those are in your cultural and um, recreational programs budget line. So Arbor Day as well. That that's the the line. Yeah, and we'll, and we're we're hoping to be able to plan something a, a little bit more substantial than what's done in the years past. Okay. Everybody okay? Yep. Okay. If we're getting out of maintenance, why equipment maintenance? <laughs> um, you're never. We're not out of maintenance, kind of like as we shared before, we're always gonna have to be um, in maintenance. We still currently maintain two joint use parks. 
We still currently maintain um, all of our athletic fields, and our nature areas. Um, we also have to be responsive. We're taking on the Greenway, which is not contracted. Uh, so where it may seem that we've gotten out of maintenance, you're continuing to grow. Your recreation services are continuing to grow. Responsibilities on the Parks and Rec Department um, have, or some of them are being transferred from Public Works to uh, the Parks and Rec Department. So I mean, you've not really gotten out of the maintenance business and we're still, I mean, it, if there's opportunity where we don't need a, pe a piece of equipment moving forward, we won't replace it. But right now we still need everything we've got. Tree lighting. In the budget, we're hoping uh, to move forward with it. We got lots of questions about it. Um, so we're looking forward to moving forward with it. Were there any specific questions? I don't remember what we were, what, why that came up to you. It's there. I, I think some of the questions were we were trying to get into more of a public private partnership Oh, and wondered how we could help move some of this over to civic groups or greater involvement because you guys really carried the burden uh, two years ago and we need to get help doing this. Yeah, um, so I think it's pretty standard for a community to have like a couple of flagship big events that they lead and then they bring in some nonprofits and civic groups to help with certain pieces of it, which, I mean, I, I think our department, I mean, there's always room to grow and to expand that and we're looking for that. And so that's something we'll always be looking to do. We've tried to incorporate them uh, into our events uh, in the past and we'll continue to do that. Uh, I think here um, there's a lot of potential on some other things that you're hearing from the community already that they want and some of your, your businesses downtown are wanting to accomplish. And so that's something that our department has been talking with our um, DAC coordinator about how, you know, we can work with them and maybe some of these events, you know, we can work together on. So. But I think when, when Larry and I were talking about that, there, and maybe it's someplace in here that we missed, there is no, not a line item that we found that kind of captures, you know, if there are two events that we enter into that, that are a public-private partnership, the town is still going to be incurring fees. And I know that it's probably super hard to guesstimate what those might be, um, but is there gonna be a repository anywhere within the budget, whether it's, if it's not this year, next year, so that we have an idea of what those costs might be or, you know, because if that happens this year, where are we gonna pull that money from? Right. So what um, we've been working to do, and just COVID really messed things up, and now as our businesses downtown are growing and starting to do more events, and we're hearing more from them, um, the current special events budget line has about $1,400 of community requested event support. Um, you're not gonna see that broken out on your list. It's part of that lump sum of special events. So okay. there's about $1,400 that have just been earmarked off to the side. Um, so what the events committee and our DAC coordinator, what we're working through right now is developing a process that we can, cause like right, uh, we had one that reached out to us and they wanna do something every month, sometimes twice a month. And um, there's just a lot involved in that. Uh, so what we wanna do is put in a process where quarterly there can be requests for our support for events and then that be something that we can bring to you guys. So it might be something mid-year where they're asking for something really substantial. Like if they wanna close down Arundel Avenue, I mean, that $1,400 isn't gonna to touch it, right? But um, if they want our help. And so we'll be able to move that through okay. that together. Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, cultural and rec programs. I think that you answered that with, you said that that's where things like Arbor Day are going to fall. Yeah, so cultural recreation programs, that's gonna also fall in that realm of where we're trying to push out into the community. So like we'll have popsicles in the park starting this Friday and that'll be every other week. Um, the Gill Street neighborhood picnic that we did um, pre-COVID, we're gonna wanna do two of those. Um, just get our, 
programs out um, and engage with the community a little bit more. So it also includes um, some programs that we want to offer downtown, nature programs, and then our Rec on the Go um, initiative. Team uniforms. The, it, it seems like there's awful, an awful lot of money that we spend on providing team uniforms. And I, I had this in my head, and perhaps it was not correct, that at, at one point the sponsors helped shoulder some of the cost of the team uniforms. Yeah, so um, this past year, uh, we actually doubled the revenue projection of sponsorships with only having one athletic season. So we actually brought in $8,000 um, this past year just for our spring sports. Um, that um, comes close to covering the cost of the team uniforms, but not 100%. Um, that is not reflected, like we don't come back to you because we have to buy those uniforms if we're gonna have a true league. Uh, so we don't come back to you mid-season um, and ask for a budget reallocation. So we budget that we're gonna have this expense. We also budget for revenue. Um, we just were really fortunate this year and we hope that continues. But it's, it's $22,000. So is that including other, like the camps and t-shirts that are, or is that 22 grand is just outfitting the uniforms that's, for the team. That's your spring sports, your fall sports, um, basketball. Um, just off the top of my head, I don't have the number in front of me, but off the top of my head, our spring sports um, team uniforms was $9,000, or eight, between eight and $9,000, I think. Um, the amount of money, and, and granted, I mean, that, so we raised just about um, in sponsorship funds to cover that cost of team uniforms. Um, that's not always been the case in the past. Um, so we hope that we can do that every league, but I can't guarantee that. And I don't want to um, surprise anybody if we don't raise that. But I mean, just, we're, we're expecting, we're coming out of COVID and we're also expecting, our community's growing, we're expecting more people to register for our programs. So there is a little bit of um, more than what, um, its cost in the year past just because we're expecting our program participation to grow. And so as these teams gain their sponsorships from, you know, whether it's trying dentistry or wherever, that's going to reduce the amount that the town has to spend on these, on the, the uniforms, correct? And then where does that money go? So we're still, we, we still spend that money. So those sponsors aren't going out and buying that uniform we still are cutting that purchase order and paying for that. But that sponsorship fund is going directly into the general fund. So it's just like the athletic payment, just like the, or the registration fee, um, that's going into okay. the general fund, so are the sponsorship fees. Um, that's how it's gone in years past. Like there's some program or some things that we get sponsorship money for mid-year where we come to you to get things reallocated. Um, but team uniforms has always been, the, or um, league sponsorship has always gone directly to the general fund and budgeted for in the budget process. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the problem, I guess, in reading this. This comment's a little bit more for Joe, I guess, but this just shows the expenditure, so you have to come back and figure the offsetting revenues, like what you're talking about. Uh, be nice, I think, to be able to see that, okay, 22,000 subnote, X number of dollars offset by X number of revenue or whatever. So we don't just look at it as, oh, hey, we're spending $22,000, but we need to know the offsets. I think that's useful information uh, when you're reading the budget. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, athletic lines. I don't know what that question is. Larry? <laughs> Shannon, somebody? I'm looking. Okay, me too here. Oh, it just it just says athletics. It says athletic lines, so oh you're saying the, oh yeah, yeah the athletic line. No, athletics. I get it. I get it, yes. I see what you're saying. All right. Because it's you know 
requested was 40,000. It's directly under the cultural and rec program line. Yeah. And then it's 26,000 that was actually requested. Right, so we reduced the request. Um, one, we were trying to be budget conscious uh, there. Um, it was a nicety, not a necessity. Um, but our goal was to relocate our rec league basketball games to Zebulon Middle School's gym um, to give us an improved atmosphere. Um, I mean, naturally, if you've ever been there when we're transitioning between basketball games, it's just, it's a challenge. It overwhelms that building. You can't run other programs. So it was one of those things, if, if we could make it happen, um, it would make an overall impact on the experience to our um, participants. Uh, so we would love to do that. I still would love to do that. Um, but we recognize this year just might not be the year to make that transition. And so that... So that was the thirteen thousand two hundred dollars that was going to go toward to the Zebulon Elementary, to for use of. Yeah. So we actually pay the communities and schools to rent the facilities at Zebulon Middle School. But I believe yes, that is what that amount was. All right. So that's actually gym rental, is yeah. what it is. Yeah. Um, which, like I, I've talked to several of our. Um, nearby neighbors i mean they all run into that it's a high expense but one of our eastern wake um counterparts they pay about a hundred thousand just running gyms so they can play their basketball league so i mean it's a it's a challenge we all have okay what money is spent through the advisory board line item you already answered that uh, she already answered that. Oh, she did. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Park landscape. Give me just one second. So that is um, Whitley Park, Go Street Park, Little River Park, uh, Zebulon Community Park. Um, is about fifty thousand of that contracted. Um, that's just your very basic mowing, weed eating, edging, uh, bush trimming. Um, if you've noticed, our trees in our park system uh, have been limbed um, better. So I, I, I notice it more at Gill Street Park than anywhere else. Um, the sight lines are much better than they used to be, um, and it creates a more inviting space. So um, that's what 50000 of that is uh, for, and then 2000 um, our beautification efforts in Arbor Day. So that, that's that's different than yeah. the so the park landscape is different than the <coughs> contract with ZCC landscaping. With the yeah. sixty-seven thousand dollars. So that um, so the community center landscaping piece of that thirty thousand that was something that. The Public Works Department, um, because they currently maintain uh, the community center, uh, so that was something um, a pricing uh, that was shared with us on what the anticipated cost would be to contract out some of that and to maintain to the same level that it currently is. Um, I mean, whether it's in that contracted line or moved to the park landscape. So the, so the grounds maintenance for the Zebulon Community Center is 67 grand, and then the other park mate landscaping is 52. Am no, I understanding that? The grounds maintenance line includes a lot more than that community okay. center. Well, because the, the, the note says yeah, contract. I yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And it'd be helpful if those two were listed right beside each other. Because you, as you go through the budget, you see landscaping maintenance, and then you go down, and all of a sudden you see more landscaping maintenance. It was kind of confusing. Yeah, um, I can check with Bobby. That's probably based upon when that budget line was created. Like back, you know, we'll say 20 years ago, they started that grounds maintenance line. So that would be my assumption as to why that separation is there in the numbering. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right, Public Works. 
Yeah, I think I've got enough to be dangerous on this one, so I'll try because some of the changes are things that I implemented. Just get caught up on the page. Tell me when you're ready. <laughs> okay. First one is, why are salaries broken into two line items? All right, so to follow up on what Sheila just shared with you, we're working with a budget uh, whose structure has been in place for 10, 15 years, and uh, based on some of the questions that we got tonight, it's probably high time we reformat it. But anyway, um, when it came to public works, the there was five different departmental units, and there was a position spread through all of them, and as as a manager, it was very hard for me to track where our costs were going. Um, individually, the, the subsections of public works didn't look like we were spending a lot of money, but when you grouped them all together, we were spending a lot of money, particularly per uh, full-time employee. So I needed to figure out a way to assign who we were paying as far as employees and where to put them. So that's what uh, the property and project management and the operations division were set up just as a way to put employees, unlike police or fire, everyone who's a firefighter, everyone who's a police officer is in that department. Um, with Public Works, I had employees spread out all over the place. And so this was a way to keep me honest and knowing, okay, who are the employees in this part of the Public Works Department who are the employees in the other parts of the um, public works budget? Okay. I'll, I'll jump ahead to the fifth bullet point. Why no 2019-2020 actuals? Because we had things spread out in so many different ways. When I combined some things, there were, they just didn't match up. And so it was really hard to track a 2019-2020 data because they were spread in so many different categories. So we could, we could parse it out, we can look for it, but that's what it was, is because I combined a bunch of departments that weren't there before. So moving forward, that's gonna be cleaned up and we're gonna actually be able to see what the actuals were. That's exactly the reason okay. behind it, yep. Okay. okay, I'm gonna phrase this question. It says stadium expenses and why. I, what I would rather have everybody here is, the ownership ratios, what we're responsible for, and the wise and, and wherefore what Wake County pays versus what we pay. Yeah, it's a, it's a 85, 15% split. Uh, we're essentially f uh, responsible for things outside of the building. So um, talking about materials and supplies on the next bullet point, we're responsible for grading and stoning the parking lot. Um, we're also responsible for the utilities, which is why the utilities is uh, broken out there. So, but the amount of time that we're contractually able to use the stadium is not an 85-15 split, correct? What, what's that question again? I'm, I'm sorry. We can use it, what, five times a year, the town itself, if we need Outside if, of season, yeah. Outside of season. But yet we're shouldering 15% of those expenses. Well, as Joe explained, we, we pay the, we maintain outside of the stadium. Now, we, water and sewer is something else we need to talk about in just a second. But... Uh, I think Wake County spent, what, a million and a half down there this year? The 85-15 really comes from when we merged in 2003, our um, back to the with Wake County, the ownership. That was a calculation made about the investment that Wake County had in it and what the town had in it at the time. So that was roughly the ownership share. So basically if we had 100% of the stadium, the county had invested at 85% of that funds at that time, we had about 15%. And so well, that's where that relation, uh, ratio comes from. We also took that and said if they made 85% of it, um, they should be paying for approximately 85%. So what we've done is divide the expenses that are interior 
uh, to the stadium that they maintain. We also took, try to take a look at this, the skill set that your public works department had. At the time, we had water and sewer, so it made sense for us to maintain water and sewer stuff. It made sense that parking lot maintenance is going to be something that took regular maintenance on it. We were closer for proximity. We could come maintain that a little quicker. We had the skill set for that. It made sense for Wake County to do inside because they had electricians on staff. They had HVAC people. They had plumbers. So we tried to use a little bit of a common sense approach and also an 85-15 split to look at the duties and responsibilities. In coming up with that 85-15%, where was Bryant's um, equity at? That was, that, was the, that was totally separate because that was personal property that he owned and potentially could sell. This was the pieces that were, if you turn the stadium upside down and shook it as a rule of thumb we done we gave, that would be the pieces that the town and the county owned. Gotcha. No, Mr. Bryant's were separate. Yes, yeah, sir. When he sold the when he sold the business to Milwaukee, then basically they, that's part of what they got was what he personally owned and transferred. And we anticipate that twenty thousand water sewer will probably drop in half with the merger. Is that yeah, yes, kind sir. of a gut feel? Yes, so there, there is going to be a you know significant drop. You know, just like. Uh, we feel like each resident is going to see about a $50, uh, $50 drop in their residential bills here. So we're expecting a fairly significant drop there also. Does that answer everybody's question? You, you asked about the five events. My understanding is that that contract is not just with Zebulon, it's with Zebulon and Wake County. That is correct, sir. So that goes to them as well. I don't know that they've ever used it. We originally had a um, what we called a sports authority that was supposed to help manage that and bring in events. The problem was that, as explained to me, was that it was in that middle slot. It was too big for certain events and too small for other events. And so that created a real problem. Now, there were some events that did come in in the past, some music events uh, that came in off season. That, but if you think about it, you know, you really don't have a heck of a lot of window. Uh, your best window is, is September, October, you know. Uh, but nonetheless, yes, they're available uh, for, for us to do something down there. Uh, I don't know how to elaborate on that any further if, if y'all have any questions. Could, could I entertain the idea that we invite the Wake County group here to present to us with what their plans are? Because I hear they supposedly are working on things, but nothing happens. And it sets, it sets vacant 300 nights a year or 300 days a year. We have a, a pretty much standing work relationship with them as far as capital facility improvements. We have invited them in the past to do for upgrades and stuff. Um, we haven't done one as the last one I think actually got the presentation here was done on a facility base. Uh, let's see the date this. But it was probably a couple of years ago just to give an update when they were doing the video board and all. But we can always invite them back to share some long range planning, facility improvements they project and stuff. And I'll be glad or Joe will be glad to reach out to them and ask them at a future work session maybe to give us an update of where their long range planning is from a capital standpoint. That'd be a great idea. Mm -hmm. The uh, um, parking lot ticket fees, um, where does that go? Just, uh, to the Muckettes. Yep. The only revenue the town of Zevin gets for the stadium is a proportionate share of the 85-15 of rent proceeds. And that is a very From the ball rent. team itself? Ma'am? From the ball team itself? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. They rent the facility. Correct. Uh, Where is that located in the schedules? Um, it should be in the revenue line items. Uh, I'd have to, uh, I'm sorry, I ain't got my book in front of me, but yes, that we get roughly roughly around $30,000 a year. And so 15% of that is uh, we, we collect the 15%. They, it's the pass through from the county. County actually gets bills it, collects it, and that piece is passed through to us. Okay, because I just I didn't see it when I was going through the schedules. Yeah. Like I, I didn't. Maybe I know I it's on the it. schedule. I just Bobby's probably looking around forty five hundred. And, yeah, and it's, it's very yeah. And it's called and it's labeled as Mudcats. It's on B five. 
On D5? D5. It says uh, lease payments baseball. At the very bottom of the page. Okay. 4,500. Um, just to note, last year we didn't get anything because they had no season. So there's a stipulation where if there's no season, they pay no rent. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, materials and supplies, that's probably. Uh, yeah, I just say basically that's the stone for the parking lot, that's Roundup for the parking lot for spraying for grass. It is um, maybe painting the pole bases or any miscellaneous pieces that we might need uh, to maintain the parking lot or the water and sewer system out there. And when you do um, travel and training, does that include like uh, training on the, the proper usage of Roundup and, and yes, things we like that? Our, we actually have five guys that are licensed with the state of North Carolina for right of ways and property. So they have five of them have certification. Anybody that does not is spraying under those license and we're required under our stormwater permit to track locations where we spray, how much we spray every day that we update it. And so we have folks that are registered for pesticide and then folks that are re registered for herbicide? Yep. Okay, all right, mm -hmm. cool. And they're required to get continuing tra uh, training each year. Okay. Okay, why hasn't building and grounds maintenance been contracted out? It has, and if you look at um, so, if you look at FY 2020 actual, what page are you? I'm on, on B15. Okay. There, um, you'll see we spent sixty nine thousand. The following year was 28,000, so this year we're at 24,000, so we're, we're roughly staying the same. Um, let me mention a couple things. The only thing that we're marginally picking up this year as far as contracting out is we've added the um, Zebulon Community Center to the contractor that is also uh, helping out with our parks. The thing that you need to know that uh, when we contract out, we're not doing it to save money. Um, we are probably, from a cost standpoint, effective, if not more effective than uh, contracting out. The reason we are contracting out is because we need to dedicate some human resources and effort to our stormwater system. So we're trying to free up the personnel that we've got um, to focus on things like stormwater. And we can contract out landscaping, so um, we are can't contracting landscaping. Questions? Okay, do we have radios that we don't use? Yeah, I think we addressed that question I earlier. thought you did too. But, um, but I'll be glad to answer anything else you may have about our radio system and how it's used. No, I, th I think you answered it. All Thank, right. you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, that's all of the departments. I guess the next thing would be um, well, I can't read my own stuff. The CIP. Um, we want to go through that. Um, are there any any items in the CIP? Yes. Okay. On E4, we did receive... Is there a reason why we still have that $28,000 for the UTV since we received one from East Wake EMS? Uh, yeah, because this was crafted before that came about. So we can take out that $28,000? You, you can do it that way. So when you, um, when you adopt the budget, you can take the $28,000 off of 
Fleet management? Yeah, no. Bobby, would you list that as under the fire capital? Is that where you would have that? Yeah, okay. So when you look at your budget ordinance, if you had adopted a budget ordinance with that reduction, that 175200 you would just subtract that amount. Um, police chief just shared with me, we are gonna need some, some money to upfit that um, vehicle. So another option is you can approve this budget amount and then um, when we're done upfitting that, we can come back to you with a budget adjustment. But we can, uh, she can also find out what, the, what it's gonna cost to upfit and then just come with a budget request? You can do it that way. Okay, perfect. So we take the $28,000 off of, uh, I'm looking on E4, so I'm not sure exactly where that needs to come from then. Yeah, so on your budget ordinance, and you would be looking at page A4. I'm sorry? You would be looking at page... Can I, can I stop just yeah. a minute? Can I make a motion to approve the budget? And then when, they, when you have something like that, we can... Uh, not saying we take anything off right now. We know some will come off. But um, you can come back any time and, and take it off and put it where else it needs to go. You need to take it off or put it on hold. Either one. Put before, that money on hold? And you can do that with other things. I was going to explain that when we finish. I think your motion is a bit premature if, in fact, I you're making it. I think we've been through this whole book. I understand. I'm, my opinion. Uh, and that, my. that you're premature because we have not finished going through the budget to understand what these people are interested in. But you've made a motion, so I'll ask if there's a second. Motion died for lack of a second. Okay. Uh, anything else y'all had on that thing? I had that UTV as well. Okay. Um, I, I just don't. I don't understand the difference between the fire fleet reserve and the fleet and equipment reserve. That's also on E4. And then, in addition, while while we're on E4, you had said something about the public works uh, crew cab that they wanted and that possibly that could um, be obtained through enterprise? Um, so I'll answer the, I'll need you to repeat the first question. So I'll answer this, <laughs> sure. all right, I'll answer the second one first. Um, we've already purchased a crew cab. Um, I, I don't know if, if that's what you're referring to. Um, the, the $45,000 for the for the 20 FY22 says public works crew cab. Oh. Um, Is that another we, crew cab? Yeah, we, we can. I don't think Enterprise is going to be able to provide that type of vehicle. Um, the other thing that's proven to be true with Enterprise is their backlog is quite substantial. We're, we're waiting months on end for these vehicles to um, arrive. So anyway, the crew cab that you're referring to, um, this, is, this is not something I think that you can, we can add to the Enterprise fleet. Okay. Um, now I need the, the, what was the first question again? Oh, I just didn't understand what the difference was between the 
fire fleet reserve and that says placed into savings to purchase next pumper so every year we're putting yep, okay. money in to purchase a pumper truck down the road yeah so here here's so uh if you uh, remember a couple of my presentations when we went through when the um with our when our property tax base shrank and we also reduced the property tax rate we stopped investing in things and one of the things that we stopped investing in is our fire equipment right and so now we're in a position where let's see if i get the year right in 2027 we're going to have to replace another fire engine which is good timing because the payments that we're making on the fire engine we've got right now are going to end right so we're good on that but then two years after that we have to replace another fire engine and so what we're doing is we raised the tax rate enough to not only make the payments on the current fire engine and then when we retired the debt on that make the payments on the second fire engine and just save a little bit of money each year so that by the time 2029 comes around we can buy that third engine outright okay that's the plan okay and the, but the second engine that we're going to need in 2027 will we be able to purchase that one outright then as well? well we'll take out loan payments so we'll we'll pay off the engine we've got we'll start new loan payments on that second one and then the third one will be the one that will okay. that we pay outright yep okay all right um and then shortly further down it says fleet and equipment reserve a hundred thousand dollars is that somewhere d doing something similar yeah so that's um that's dependent upon if you all approve a yard waste fee or not we, we don't know how much money we're going to generate with a yard waste fee but we're thinking that if you add that three dollars that will generate around a hundred thousand dollars and so we didn't want to force you all into committing to a fee increase so for this first year we just said We'll put that money into reserve, and that way we're not dependent upon it. If you do pass it, then uh, we'll use those funds to do something like replace our leaf truck. Um, okay, so that's down. So that's the orange yard waste fee of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So a hundred thousand of that would be going towards a new leafer. Down the road? No, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm confusing things. So if you go further up the page and look under, uh, what is that, that second gray bar that calls, that calls out medium duty, mm -hmm. and you'll see a leaf truck there. Oh, yes. Okay. 50000 of that yard waste fee to go to that. And we don't know if we'll generate another 100000 but 100000 to go into a, a reserve account. So... We anticipate, we don't know, I think this seems a little high, but we think generate 150000 from that yard waste fee, 50 of that would go to leaf truck payments, 100 would be locked into reserves. For, would this be for any fleet Yes. in the future? It doesn't have to be relegated to public works, or it, and it's not going to be tied to something that has to be... Uh, spent on you know because of the yard waste fee well th that would be the intent i try to i try to match up fees with with uses uh it, it, you you can get into kind of a grab bag scenario real quick if you don't match up fees with our revenues with expenditures so the intent would be to dedicate that to public works okay okay thank you you're welcome other questions on the CIP, I have a few, but I wanted to get y'all out first. Um, I have a question about the on E5, the the extent and scope of the card access and cameras for the community center. Because it seems like this is this is a building where the public is going to be entering at all different times. Where are those, where's that $50,000 going to go as far as, there's a lot of, we're getting there. A lot of not me's. We're getting there. <laughs> I was pointing to Sheila cause she could talk to you about how that community center operates that there's, there's 
some public access elements, but there's some that are not public access elements. So I'm not as familiar with the actual breakdown of how much like the camera system versus access card is. So, uh, but I can say um, our camera system is very outdated. Um, we have a lot of limitation in what we can see and both inside the community center and outside of the community center. Um, and there's also, um, you know, there's, there's a responsibility that we have on our participants. And uh, I'm, since we're in summer camp time, like that's one of the things that um, I think that we need to have a good understanding at all times as who's in the building, who's as, who has access to the building, who has entered the building at a certain time. Um, just because there are a lot of coming and goings in that building, it is open to the public with the, the general operating hours, but having a really good understanding um, when Monday morning when we come in, um, if something were to happen or something is triggered that the building has been accessed and we weren't anticipating it, knowing who that was, when it happened, so that we can go back and look, um, is, is a great peace of mind as we are continuing to operate and serve participants in our building. Um, did you want to talk about the breakdown of camera services? We had it priced out to do um, access as well as cameras. And so what we asked them to do is to give us a ballpark figure of what the cost would be. And then when we've got that, we would determine at that point what the best use of that money would be, whether it's going to be cameras or an extensive um, card access system or a hybrid. And we're anticipating it being a hybrid. We think the cameras are very, very important. And we couldn't afford to do all the cameras that we think are necessary, as well as an extensive uh, card access system. And, and explain the card access system then. Would it just be to the offices? It would or be, it, it's going to be tracking employees that come into the building? Right. You know, um, like when the building's open to the public? It'll track the employees when they come in in the mornings and after the doors are locked in the evenings. Um, it will also access into the office area. Those will be locked um, all the time so that the public cannot enter them and the staff is, um, is safer. Okay, all right. It'll, it'll also, I mean, you've got four exterior doors. You've got one that is um, accessible, that's open to the general public during operating hours. Uh, but the other three doors, I mean, somebody could pop into the building and you not know it. Um, and, and so that just helps us with that tracking. Um, getting So they would remain locked during operating hours unless hours. someone swiped in with a key card? It, it, I'm just trying to understand yeah. how this, this system is going to work for work the money that we're spending and in something that has a lot of community traffic already. It will work just like this building where the side door is open to the public, but the front door and the back door are locked so much have badge access. So it will work very similar in that form as far as badge access. Okay. All right. Thank you. Other other thing. Um, well I have a few questions. So the um, the Judd North of Rendell signal 100,000, I'm assuming that that money is actually going into dedicated fund balance until such time as the final decision is made on the location of the fire station. Now this is, um, this would be design funds. And so if we're gonna, I'm not saying that we would have to spend it spend it this year but if if we're moving forward with a fire station design we'll need to include the design of the signal at the time so this is these are des design funds no and i understand that my point is it seems a bit premature so if it was just simply dedicated as a dedicated fund balance doesn't mean that you would proceed 
this year with the engineering or the design unless we got to the point where we were moving on the fire station. I think you're gonna be moving on the fire station. Maybe. I think that's my recommendation. Okay, but we could put it in fund balance designated until such time. Do we still have the um, design from earlier when we were talking about the um, fire station, did that go back into dedicated fund balance? Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, that's that, that um, those funds have already been locked into um, fund balance. They're are, dedicated. They're already there. Okay. But this is not. This is not. Okay, but it could be. Just put it in dedicated fund balance until such time as you know that study needs to occur. That's my recommendation that the board do what they want to with. So you would, I gotta check with Bobby. Do we have a, um, a capital fund set up for the fire station? Okay. So wh what we would be doing is we would be dedicating these funds towards a capital fund for the fire station. That, that's all I, I think, I that think Joe, prudent. I just think it's a little premature to go out there and start doing design until we acquire the property and then, you know, the final decision is made by this board that yes, that's where they want to put the station. Okay, this uh, is this is just the budget funds. I'm not gonna, we're not gonna move forward designing a fire station until we have you all on board. I understand that. Okay. And all I'm trying to do is make this match that. And where is the Glaxo land purchase budgeted in here? Okay, so if you, the, um, Different document, if you, if you go back and you look at your comprehensive annual financial report and you look at the fund balance page, you'll see the, the committed fund balances in there. So that, uh, those I'm funds so. are already locked in. Yeah, I know we've got funds committed not only from previous years, but also the sale of the old uh, property that was gonna be a fire department at one time. You've already recognized those funds this year and, they've got, and they got rolled into that fund balance as well. Yeah, but shouldn't that be in here as a an expense, even though it's in the uh, general fund or no, in the reserve this is, fund? This is just your existing budget and the capital improvement plan, the funds that are already locked in. That's in your financial report. And it was six fifty. Uh, six fifty is what the total was. Um, was it one hundred and eighty we got from the sale? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the next thing is explain to me the Jones Street connector because there's a couple of possibilities there is what you're actually talking about and I don't remember specifically. Was this to connect the open spaces on the, uh, this would be on the east side of North of Rendell or was it the road going all the way through the property? No, this is, this is to connect the gaps. So that would be the property behind Hillbillies. It's on E1, Larry. Yeah. Okay. So would we connect? Would we collect fees once those properties are developed to replenish this fund? Yeah, we could. Right now, what's built was built by the people that developed. So. In this, in this case, I know that, that Hillbillies is closed now, and I don't know what's going on with their property. Uh, they actually own the front and the back. They cut the back off so they wouldn't have to, to do that. But it seems to me that whoever develops it should bear the burden of the road improvement. We, we would collect a payment in lieu from them. I'm sorry, I'm having We would collect a payment in lieu from them. Okay, so that would reimburse this money that we're expending. Yeah, that, well, no, because the, all right, look at the very far right, the, uh, the notes. That 340 assumes we are getting developer contribution as well as support from DOT 
to do work at um, widening the ramp. So, so you should, I mean, I would love for us to come out ahead and, and not spend the 340, but we should expect that we're going to spend 340. Okay, but hold on. Half of the road is not on those parcels. So that's part of it. Part of this project is also off site. It's near the intersection of Dogwood and um, Arendelle. So you're figuring the 340 is our share of the cost. I am. And like I What's said, I would love to. Cost projected for the front. Excuse me. What's the total cost projected? Oh, I'd, I'd have to go back and look at the notes. I want to say four, maybe four, four, four twenty-five. Are we going to have to front the 425, or are we going to hold this and do the work once I, some developer comes? I think along? you need to front. I think the I think the situations on the Arundel corridor are getting very bad, so we've got to do something in the way of relief out there. I, I understand that, Joe. What I'm trying to do is understand the flow of money on it. The uh, if we've only busted 340, but we're going to have to spend 400 and something then we're going to have to go deeper into fund balance initially in order to do that work, are we not? We would. We'd so why wouldn't you budget the full amount expecting a return? Well, in part because I'm hopeful and optimistic, and at the time I was developing this, we, we had a developer hot, ready to move on it. Okay. Well, that, I mean, that bothers me a little bit that it's not true dollars. I mean... It concerns me. I don't know if it bothers any of our board members or not. But uh, well, the the other thing is that if when it comes time to move, we would bring back to you options on rescoping. I think I think the bottom line that has to happen is that is the Jones Street connector. If we make this project affordable by keeping out the intersection improvements at Dogwood and Arundel, I think that's okay. So there's a way to make this project work with rescoping. Yeah, I, I get that, but you, you understand where my concerns come from. I do. That we're, we're not budgeting enough money that we're going to have as much as we're going to have to spend initially to make it work. That, that's my concern. Well, can the this transportation reserve be used for that purpose? It says save for FY23 paving, um, but it's from the un, unspent tag fee. Does it have to go? towards paving or could we use that if we needed those extra funds to move ahead with that project? Yeah, you, you could borrow against that. The, the reason that uh, we're finally starting to get um, our head above water on street paving and the reason we're able to do that is because we've got the dedicated gas tax as well as the dedicated vehicle fees. Mm -hmm. And so you can make that change that you talked about. Just know that you might be um, losing ground on the street paving front. And as long as you, you understand what the trade-off is, you can definitely do it. It's, there's not a limitation on what you can use the funds for as long as it's a road type of project. Well, let me just ask for a bit of clarification then, because then if you look under what is proposed for the, you know, our annual street resurfacing up at the top of that page, um, it's going to ask for another two hundred and eighty-eight thousand dollars. Does that t is part of that two hundred and eighty-eight thousand dollars coming from that one hundred and forty-five thousand that you're asking to be put in the reserve right now? Um, no. So the go over a column, look under FY twenty twenty-three proposed. You. Where it says tag fee and pow bill, go over that yep. way. Uh -huh. So one, one, the 160 and the 128, that's that 288 that would fund that. So the 145 that's getting locked in now, that's not necessarily something that you would have to use for street paving. So we don't have to use it for street paving, so it could be used for the Jones Street 
connector and we're still not going to be getting ourselves into a pickle because we've already accounted for the funds that we're anticipating using for paving for beginning in 23. That is true. Does that make sense, Mayor, to, to do it that way? Do we have to word it differently? Yeah, you yeah, you just have to restructure it a little bit, but it's uh <coughs> My concern is just very simply that we got a, a number in there that's not enough. So even if we're going to get reimbursement at some point, uh, we're going to have to we're going to have to upfront it, and the only way we can do it is go deeper into fund balance. Right. Unless you unless you do this different scenario. So. The verbiage would have to be to dedicate the 145,000 transportation reserve funds. I, I would. There is, 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 I don't is, think you need to get into verbiage. What's going to happen is this 145 is going to automatically uh, roll into reserves. If we have to move forward on this Jones Street connector earlier before a developer is ready, that's what we'll do. We'll come back to you with a, a rescoped project and see if it fits within the 340. Uh, if it doesn't, or if you want to do the full scope, we can make the recommendation to pull that 145 out of your reserves. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. I feel I feel good about that then. Okay. As long as we're clear. All right. Um, I this I have a, some heartburn over this West Sycamore Arundel to church, and I'm not necessarily here to kill it but I would like for us to have a lot more conversation on it before we proceed I agree I agree too it's two-thirds of a block and I, I really need to un I would rather have staff come back with a better breakdown when we're ready to move on it because I don't feel comfortable allocating those funds. Well, I saw three heads nod. Yes, I don't know how the other two feel, but. Um, Does it also include the uh, sidewalks? Yeah, that's project? all part of that. Yeah, that's, right. that's, what, that's what that is. That's the, the sidewalk. Uh, and the intersection. Because uh, wasn't it uh, some discussion about um, seeing if the church would. Uh, well, that was for the right of way, but but apparently they that falls within the. You know, we just need to have a lot more conversation. Church. I, I agree. That, I would that's like all Methodist I'm asking church for Sycamore. is to earmark it oh. and put it on on a hold. Don't move forward until we have further discussion. But you can leave it in the budget or take it out and come back and dedicate it later. Either one accomplishes the same goal as far as I'm concerned. But. Uh, that's all I'm trying to say. So what would we prefer to do, guys? Take it out now and come back and add it in later? Well, I think or, we or could, do you or still want to use it? the money, though? If you don't do that part of the sidewalk, would you use pick another area? Well, we would once we discuss it. Uh, right. I mean, I mean, we need our sidewalk. So, I mean, if you oh, don't I'm, want to I'm do that, one, yeah, yeah, I understand. understand. Uh, yeah, I'm I, not yeah. trying to kill the project. What I'm trying to do is have us to have a, a much better discussion of it now it may come down there's considerable amount of sidewalk that's oh, yeah. already down that way that uh i just would like for us to uh have a uh, a robust if you will conversation about it before proceeding with any engineering or contracts right, we could keep it on the keep it in the budget and just put a hold on the project for the discussion correct okay that's fine so the, the hold on the West Sycamore Arundel to Church project. Yeah, 315,000. Yep. Right. Okay, any other discussions on any of that? Um, shall we still, I'm assuming that that ADA transition plan, that was for all of the crosswalks or was that singly for the crosswalks involved with Sycamore? This, this is an assessment on whether we meet the conditions of the, of the American Disabilities Act. This um, will be a factor 
in pursuing grant funds. Um, this also <coughs> could Excuse be, me. and I'm less certain about this, this could possibly have some punitive effects with it as well. The point being is this is an assessment overall of our compliance or non-compliance and how do we get compliant with the American Disabilities Act. No, I, I understand that and, and I'm fully supportive of it. I just want to understand the scope. Is it is this, is the transition plan just for the West Sycamore Arundel to Church project? It's for all of our? Okay, thanks, Sheila. Yeah, it's town citywide. Okay, it's townwide. Good. Okay. Everybody satisfied on that? Yeah, on that one, yep. Okay. The only other one that I really wanted us to talk further on is, hold on. Anyway, with alleyway activation, Again, I don't want to kill it. I want to have a better understanding. I know speaking with one of you, you were not even aware where it was going to be, which alley we were talking about. So uh, I just, before we proceed on that, I'd like to have further conversation. It's on uh, page E8. Yes, sir. Alley activation phase two, muter alley. Right. Let's put it on hold until we have further discussion and understanding. I feel comfortable with that, but I am also very open to having more discussion about it because I think more discussion and more clarification is always well, that's, a good that's thing. Well, that's all I'm asking for, further yeah. discussion before any movement occurs on it. So, so just uh -huh. put, yeah. put a hold on the alleyway activation? Okay. Yeah, same thing as we did on the other. Yep. Uh, uh, I, I have two things once you're done, Bob. Okay, let me look real quick. I think, I'm, I think that's it for me. I probably made enough people mad. So. <laughs> Sorry about that, but, uh Okay, so if we go to E6, um, the public works shed, I um, have some concerns about the overall cost. I've spoken with some building engineers <coughs> from Olympia Steel and talking to them about all of the things that were listed in the um, requested CIP for the shed their number for a building twice the size that is being requested from public works came in at about $150,000. But with the exception that I, I only had conversation about one 14 foot um, uh, rolling bay door and not the three that were proposed and also in conversation, uh, they said that steel prices are significantly higher this year, twice as high than they were last year. A lot of that in his 20 whatever years of experience, he believes is due to the increase that we've seen overall from the pandemic in the additional um, cost of, of um, lumber as well and he anticipated that those prices would stabilize if not even go down and so i i'm just concerned about the three hundred and fifty thousand dollars i would like to make sure that we have a shed but i also think that 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 needs to be evaluated further discussed further so i would also like to put a hold on that if no one is opposed. So all of those are not killed. They're, they're not killed because I think I that know, we should I, get I'm a shed. I'm saying this for clarification before the motion. 
they're actually just simply put on hold for further clarification and discussion. Mm -hmm. Is everybody okay with that? No, I, I like the shed. I think we need it. Okay. No. Well, that's just not saying it's not going to be built, mm -hmm. uh, but I understand what you're saying. I appreciate your input. Okay. Mayor, let me share with the board. Just um, and, and the timing would be for a while before the shed would get built, but I want, I want staff to hear this as well. I'm going to withhold pursuing a payloader and a leaf truck until I know that there's a place to keep them out of the elements. Um, so I need to evaluate not moving forward on the public work shed. It may have an impact on um, the fleet side as well, but we'll, we'll have that information. I just wanted to share that. So you all just had full information. So basically what you're saying is putting it on hold is not gonna hurt anything. No, putting it on hold, I just want you to know it's, it's also going to affect other things. I understand that, but you said you wanted to evaluate those, if I understood you correctly. Instinctively, I think by not having a shed, we're not going to have a place to park the payloader or the leaf truck. I get that part. I had understood that there was a timing situation before proceeding with those and that this was not the only consideration. Now, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I'm just telling you the way I understood it. I think from a timing standpoint, it's not going to make a big difference. I just wanted the board to know that there's ramifications that go beyond just the shed. That's it. Okay. That's, that's all I was trying to do, Jeff. All right. Uh, the only other thing then, unless anybody has, did you, Shannon, you said you might have some other stuff. Did you get everything you had? Um, I, I, I have one more. Okay. On E8, I am not in support of a building upfit grant. I think that those grants need to be, I would prefer to see those as low interest loans. I'm not sure how that would be managed, but I know that that's how other municipalities handle that. And I realize that we have buildings that are in significant disrepair in the community and the insides do need a lot of a lot of work to bring them up to code but i just don't know how comfortable i feel offering internal upfit grants when we could be spending our money in ways that will benefit the overall aesthetic of the the downtown area i.e. through the outside facade grants. Okay. May I make a comment just for the board yes, to consider? Sure. So um, there's a couple of ways to do this. It can be a grant, I think more likely a loan or a uh, through tax increment financing. There's lots of ways that this could be packaged and we can bring you back the policy options whether it's a grant, whether it's a loan, whether it's a tax increment finance. What I don't want to do is create those policies if you're not interested in um, having some sort of financing structure to repair the inside of these buildings. And, and I will share with you, your facade grant is really limited on what it can do. I'm so sorry. Your, your facade grant is really limited on what it can do. Mm -hmm. if, if you're wanting to get these buildings um, rehabilitated, you're gonna need something like a building up bit, whether it's a grant or a loan or a tax increment financing. Those are questions you can solve later when we bring you back some policy. But if you all don't do this, I'm not gonna have staff develop any plans on it. So just know that if you budget the money, it doesn't mean you're gonna do a grant. It just means that I'm gonna tell staff, okay, develop some options for the board to consider well i would like options for us to to be considered but it's worded as a building upfit grant and so i just need to know that staff is going to work to give us other options because i i really think that there are better ways for us to go about you know like utilizing the dac program and 
revitalizing Main Street. If you budget this, we will bring you back options. I had understood, and Joe, you and I have had this conversation. I know you're probably tired of hearing it, but uh, I had understood that there, you had to manage that money in a certain way without it had to go through some other organization. Is that not the case anymore? There's a lot of details involved. Yeah, I know the, the course that I took at Chapel Hill was very explicit, and I know you don't necessarily agree with everything. That I can't even remember the guy's name right now. But uh, it concerned me uh, because it was money being spent inside the building. And I know I've heard y'all say that, that other communities are doing it. I just want to understand uh, the logistics of that and how the law changed. So, you know, just yep. that way. We're not going to put you in harm's way. But I don't want to spend the time developing, because this is going to be a complex process. If, if you're interested in budgeting it, then we will bring you back and we'll clarify what the law says and what it doesn't say. But uh, if you're not interested in it in principle, then we've got other stuff that we can work on. That's all. But we're not going to put you in harm's way. We're going to clarify what your options are, and we're going to answer the questions and the concerns that you've got regarding the legality of it. Well, the question to the board is then, do you want to add this new grant possibility? I think we're all in agreement. We want an incentive downtown to get those buildings rented out, and no money is going to be spent until a policy is written, so this is going to come back before us, and I trust you're not going to get us in harm's way at all, so I would suggest we leave it there and wait and take a look at the policy. Okay. 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 Anything else anybody has? We had, do have one more thing, by the way, and that's the fee schedule. If anybody has any any questions or concern in the fee schedule. I did have one question about, well, I had two questions about the fee schedules. First, Sheila, I didn't notice that the tent rentals for the farmer's market were included in the fee schedule and maybe they needed to be. Um, and. I just don't understand, Chris, um, I love how your head popped up because you knew I was going to be talking to you. Um, there are things like $5 for chainsaw and I, I just don't like, it, how is that, how are those fees parceled out? Is that it, it, if? Yeah. It, um, you see a lot of equipment that Public Works owns yeah, on that yeah, list. Yeah. And what that is, is it gives us, uh, in case we get in a situation where we have to do a nuisance abatement, we have to assist the fire department or the police department with a resource to abate a condition that they in, we have adopted rates that if, if I use a light tower, if I use the backhoe, I know what rate to charge out to those guys. Okay, that's you great. Know. Thank yes, you so much. Anything else in fees? Mm -mm. Okay, I think that pretty well covers the line items of the budget with the exception of the uh, nonprofits. Um, I was looking for the list of the applicants. Did we have that? This is yeah, within yeah. the. I got it. We, we were going to see if you actually put money in, and then Bobby was going to have a presentation after. We were going to wait till you adopted the budget to see what kind of money you put in there, and then Bobby's got a presentation on that. Okay. Uh, help me out so I don't have to dig through it. How much is proposed in it? Uh, 5000 5, 5, The 5, same 5000 that we yeah, always do. Yeah, and that's, I hope it stays there, to be honest with you. We got really carried away years ago. Um, okay, well, and that's the case then. With the modifications that we made to earmark and hold actions, you have those. Listed, I assume, should, should I read them back? Huh? Do they need to be read back? Yeah, that would be if, helpful. If I, if I can, I'll make a motion and we can discuss it based upon what we've already done here. And that would be that we adopt Ordinance 2021-74 with the exception that the alley activation phase two for 100,000 be put on hold, even though it's budgeted. The West Sycamore Arendelle project for 315,000 
also be budgeted but put on hold and the public works building for three hundred fifty thousand dollars be budgeted and also be put on hold and then the the uh, 28 the 28 oh, and the twenty eight thousand dollars for the uh, atb UTB. from ems be removed from the budget and the uh, study on the um, fire station funds i think we can leave that there because they're going to have to come back to us that's the way I understood it. It was just that that'll leave my concern. My concern is I didn't want us to go out there until this board at some point makes that final decision or make you know what I mean. I don't belabor the point. So. And the options on the um upfit for the um they're, they're gonna move forward and then come back to us with a Yeah, that's a citywide project and probably needs to be left in there as is because there are penalties if you're not ADA compliant. Oh, I think he was talking about the inside outfit, not the ADA, right? Not the facade, the interior. He, he was talking about the interior outfit. Oh, yeah, we'd leave the, leave the facade in there because a the policy is going to come back to us to be reviewed. So that's, none of that 30000 would be spent. So I would. So if I can clean that budget up. So can I second that with what he just said in the tiny bit of discussion that just happened, or do we need to re? I'll second it. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion or comments? All in favor? And the motion carries. A joke and issue a sigh of relief. Hot dog. <laughs> okay. All right, folks. Thank you. That's. Uh, it was Thank you. A really good conversation, in my opinion, and I appreciate it. Uh, nonprofit funding distribution. All right. Um, just for a reminder before we get into the details of the applicants. Um, the town policy is for no more than $1,000 to any single organization and no more than 5000 total, which you know, just um, basically appropriated the 5000 um, to be divided up. Um, <clears throat> just a, a review of the procedure to, and how it went down. Uh, in the budget, you saw 5000 It was kind of put in there as a plug number. Um, the notice of application period was uh, that it was open, was posted on the website and to our social media outlets on January 11th, uh, stating that the uh, application was available on the website and that it was due back to us by February 8th. Uh, we received 10 total applications, including uh, one that was late, uh, but uh, approved for consideration. Uh, they totaled $9,000. Um, there were presentations made by most of them at the March 1st meeting, uh, some of them written, some, uh, I think one video, and some people in person. Uh, a two-step policy analysis to consider. Uh, first, look at the service delivery. Does the nonprofit assist the town in delivering a typical municipal government public service, uh, such as law enforcement, fire protection, et cetera? Um, a community goal. Does this nonprofit deliver a public service typical of county government responsibilities, such as public health and social services? Uh, as far as fiscal analysis and efficiency, is this reallocation of town uh, dollars and fees uh, not a nonprofit a means to meet the municipal government responsibilities more effect, uh, efficiently? And effectiveness? Is a, is a reallocation of uh, town dollars a means to address the local need identified by adopted policy that surpass, <clears throat> surpasses or is exceptional to a countywide goal? Um, you'll see on pages C2 through C36 in your budget document, those are all the applications uh, in detail. Uh, they weren't included again in this uh, PowerPoint or, or the attachment with it, uh, but you'll see all the applicants and their requested amounts uh, there before you. Um, so basically at this point, it's up to you guys how you want to uh, divvy it up. 
So I'll open the I would floor for that. Thank you, Bob. Oh, okay, hold on a second. Now we got nine thousand and five thousand spent. Right. What I was going to suggest was I would run down the list and see how many of the ones on there would get enough votes to stay on there. Does that make sense to y'all? And then we go back and look at fund allocation. Yeah, we Everybody can do it that way. That's that? fine. Right. Which, of course, which one yeah. came in late? Okay. All right. What? Go the extra mile, I think, was it? Or uh, progressive was it progressive teamwork. teamwork. Yeah. That was like. Yeah. I think that we can take that one off. I really think well, it's sticking this to this way. The... Glenn had a um, Share his glory. Had they been submitting an application? I think this is second year. Is this the Reverend Gray? No, no. this is Roger Brantley. Which one was the Reverend Gray? I think that was progressive outreach. Uh, for progressive team ones outreach. Okay. Okay. Uh, how many would like to keep do for him on there? I might keep. Do I would. Oh, okay. okay. That's all I want is a show of hands. How many <laughs> would? Okay. East Wake Education Foundation. Absolutely. Interact. Yep. <laughs> We're probably going to keep them all. Uh, Miss Zebulon. Okay, got four votes. Preservation Zebulon. Mm -hmm. Annie, you, no. I get two votes. I, I don't understand what Annie was saying. <laughs> okay. I didn't vote on that. All right, share his glory. Share his glory. No. Nope. Shepherd Care Medical Clinic. Oh, yeah. Zebulon United Methodist Church Food Pantry. Well, I don't know if that's another one. Wait a minute. I need to understand. Who voted for that? One more time, because we got two votes to know. Go the extra mile. I'm not even sure what they are. Could you help me again on that? Go the mile, sister. Hmm? I said, they're the Miles sister. That, is, that was new, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they came and spoke. On page C14. C14 is where their application is. I know, I just, just tell me. I, I've already locked. Uh, their mission statement says to improve and reach families in the Zebulon area in need of Food and clothing resources. Okay. Um, they intend to use the grant to provide the proper equipment needed to help the mission run more efficiently. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Go the extra mile. Who wants to do that? Nope. Progressive teamwork outreach. Outreach. Nope. Okay, so what we have is four that the majority wanted. I need do for him, East Wake Education, Interact, and Miss Zebulon. So And Shepherd Security. No, Shepherd Security didn't get Yeah it did. Yeah, it did. Votes. I'm sorry. I put a check mark, not an X. Thank you, Glenn. Okay, so we got five. What was the other one then? Shepherd's Care. Oh, the Miss Zebulon. Yeah, I'll read them again just to be sure. Do for him, East Wake Education, Interact, Miss Zebulon, and Shepherd's Care. So that's five. So the question is, we did seven. All of well, Miss Zebulon <laughs> only got five hundred dollars last year. But if you want to spend all the five thousand, you can give me to. Mayor, I would really like to make a plea for Zebulon United Methodist Church Food Pantry. Throughout the pandemic this year, they've done an amazing, amazing job. So. Well, what do y'all want to do? I think you were the only one that voted for them, Shannon. Uh-oh. I don't have trouble. Did you? Okay. I I'm did. Sorry. Yeah, I voted um, for it, too. But, okay. So if we could, some of the others, like, um,
you know, but we didn't get the, y'all didn't get the votes, so, I mean, but, yeah, we could, was one? I've got, like, due for him, I, I put 500, and I put 1,000 yeah. for East Wake, and 1,000 for Interact, and. I, I agree with that. Maybe we, maybe this method, maybe we should just do it like we did it last year. Because there, there were more people. I mean, I, I think that narrowing it down was good, but. Everybody here could, I have it so everybody gets something. A, a lot of these, in my opinion, are duplicate services. Mm -hmm. uh, I say a lot of them, but some of them are duplicate services. I agree. And I don't know, I have a problem so picking one service over another, another when they're both doing the same thing. But mm -hmm. nonetheless, um, we don't have to give them a thousand. We don't have to give them five hundred. We give them a hundred, or we do whatever. You know, make y'all happy. Well, I mean, I know that that I think Bev was interested in go the extra mile. And I think someone else was maybe you, Larry. Do what? Or, or maybe Annie. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I would be fine with that. You know, if we could split to go the extra mile with Zebulon United Methodist. They seem to both be doing mm -hmm. food related ministry work, but perhaps in different in different capacities so we could split that money. Well, so does progressive teamwork outreach. They, they basically but, they basically do the same thing. I just I, I, they were a late submission, so I kind of feel like but if you're passionate about it, Glenn, then we can. That's what we're, this is all about. Let's work it out. Well, all right, right now we have it down to five. So what you're saying, you want to go back and now modify it. Is that right? I want to be sure what we're doing here. Is that what everybody wants to do? Well, I was going to say, if you want to accept the nine that were on time, times five is $4,500. And then somebody gets an additional 500 if you're going to spread it out among all the applicants. That's another way to do it. Well, I've spread it out one. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that actually we can spread it out between Do For Him, East Wake, Interact, Miss Zebulon, Share His Glory, Shepherd's Care, Zebulon United Methodist Church, Go the Extra Mile, and then maybe that progressive team works, Glenn? And do that, split that up. Yeah. How does that work for you guys? Yeah, because that's and do Okay, it. let's talk money on them. All okay? right. Okay. So the only one that you're knocking out is Preservation Zebulon. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. I know. I just and want to be clear where we are because I. I thought we were going another way, and that's fine. And, it's, it's and I would, I would think, you know, we've been, we've been supporting them, and now we don't want to support them. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think that's what we're saying. Love to have them. They, I think that, that they could be great for them to utilize mm -hmm. our town hall if they have events. Because I know that's a cost to the town. Okay, let's let's try, let's try it again, folks. All Apparently, right. what I wanted didn't work, and that's fine. Okay. Uh, so, how much do you want to give to these people? Uh, a thousand for Interact. <laughs> a thousand for Interact. That's what I've got. I feel good about that. A thousand to East Wake. Education. I also support that as well. Go extra mile, a thousand. Um, a thousand for shepherd care. Okay, I agree with that. Say that again. A thousand, a thousand for shepherd care. care. All right, that leaves you two thousand. Five hundred to Miss Sebulon organization. Okay. Leaves you fifteen hundred. Uh, I forget who we have. Um, 500 to Zebulon United Methodist Zeblin Church. Zebulon Food Pantry. Okay. Did we do do for him? Do we want to do 500 for them? Did we, did we put 500, 500 for do for, for him? 
five hundred for due for him? That's what I, I put okay. on mine. That's, I don't know that's if, fine. If yes. That's, Is that what you want to do? Be good. Five hundred. Yes. How much left? Five hundred. Um, Is it so five? You can go two fifty a piece on the last two. Two fifty a piece on the last two. Sounds good. <laughs> So that's all right, let me run down them one more time. Yep, I'm yep, be yep, sure yep, that we're all... Make sure our math. Okay, everybody got funded, but Preservation's evidence. Due for him, got five. East Wake got uh, East Wake Foundation, five thousand. Interact, a thousand. Miss Zebulon, five hundred. Share his glory. Uh, yeah, I didn't mark that one. Uh, Shepherd's Care got a thousand. So There's a thousand for shepherd's care. Oh, oh. No, or, or do no, we give no, him a thousand? Do we yeah, give him a thousand? Yeah, that's what um, Glenn said. Let me, let me re recalculate here. <laughs> okay. I have a lot of new works on my paper. 2,500. 2, 2, 2, 2,000. 4,000. 4, got 2,000 left. No, Share His Glory was not funded, so we need to know. We, we got to go well, back. He does help with the children. Say that again. I mean, that one helps with some of the children, doesn't it, here in town? No, I know. What I'm saying is the way that you allocated money, we ran out of money. So Shares Glory has zero, so we need to go back and modify something. Okay. Well, go the extra mile and Progressive have 100, 500 each? 250 each. Okay, 250. That's 500 together. Um, 250 uh, for... Um, Food pantry, two fifty for Sherry's glory. You okay with that? Mm -hmm. Two fifty, two fifty. I'm willing to compromise. I'd rather take it yeah. away from Miss Zebulon, quite honestly, because I think that there's not as large of a reach into the community. Okay. Well, but... let's find out what the board wants to do. The, the choices are to take and split the five hundred from either United Methodist and give half to share his glory or take half of it from Miss Zebulon and give half. So how many want to take it from the food pantry? I don't want to take it from either one of them. What about um, take half from uh, do for him? Yeah, you could do that. Okay. All right, so two, do two, two, two fifty. That'd be two fifty. So that's what you want to do is take it yeah, from do for him. Yeah, 250 for 250. that one and 250, 250 for, for share. And then 250 for share. All right, I'm going to run down them one more time. Okay, <laughs> but I think we got it. Do for him, 250. Somebody do the math. Be sure we, you know. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> do for him is 250. East Wake Education, 1,000. Interact, 1,000. Miss Zebulon, 500. Share his glory, 250. Shepherd's Care, 1,000. Zebulon United Food Pantry, 500. Go the extra mile, 250. Progressive teamwork, two, uh, 250. 5,000. That's right. it. That's it. Okay. Everybody happy with that? Yes. That's good. So, would somebody care to venture motion. with a motion? <laughs> I make motion. a motion. Second. Glenn, Glenn okay, made a motion. Glenn made Is the motion. Is there a second? Annie, second. I second. Wait, wait. Can Annie make the motion since it's her birthday? I thought somebody made it. <laughs> Glenn made the motion. All right, look. All in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Done and done. I appreciate it, folks. Joe, manager of support. Two things. Um, I know that you all know this, so I'm telling you as a way to tell the community. The... Um, Zebulon Historic District application went before the National Register Advisory Committee. They unanimously recommended that it be moved forward for consideration to the National Park Service. So that's the next step. It will go before the National Park Service to be considered. The second thing is uh, thank you for your time on the budget. Um, I meant what I said. We're here to put you in a place to win and to be informed. So um, any comments you've got on the budget before we start assembling the next budget, um, please uh, share them with me. That's it. Thank you. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Second.